Um, and then um, the end of it will be the Thane's, Thane's Unfiltered, which is Thane's questions. And I say to them they can ask anything they want. Normally it's sensible questions. Give cool. I just don't know my inside leg measurement. I haven't been for a suit or anything like that for a while. Yeah, it is, ain't it? About if, 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 if that's what they've asked. Even for that one time you were in court? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> There's your intro. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, yeah. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the second episode in our new talk show. Loads of you suggested great names below. I might have picked one by now, I might not have. But um, basically what we're going to do during this show, if you watch the first one, you'll already know this, we're going to pull in guests from around the community, hopefully, and talk to them about their life within Warhammer, their experiences, things they like to do, things they enjoy, how they got to where they are, that kind of stuff. Um, we already brought in James from Siege. People love that one, so we've got another guest, a special guest in today. If you're watching this the day it first comes out, thank you so much for being a Skull Tier member or above. If you're not sure what we're talking about because you're watching this on the Saturday, we basically put this up for all of the members five days before. So you get five days early access if you're a member of the channel, and then on Saturday it goes out to general public. So you all still get to watch it, even if you're not a member. We're still making sure all of our content's free, but we do give members the early access. So big shout out to you if you're already watching this. If you want to catch the future ones early, currently we're trying to aim for around one a month right now, uh, then you need to become a Skullty member of the channel. But big shout out to everyone who's a member. You're all amazing. We love you. Anyway, today we are joined by the amazing, the incredible, the slightly beautiful, Mr. The War Hipster. Slightly beautiful. Slightly beautiful, yeah. <laughs> slightly. Well, I love that. Other people get jealous otherwise. I have to say slightly beautiful. Slightly right? beautiful is good. I think that sums up me and most of the things I do in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, War Hipster is the name of the channel on YouTube, uh, but your, your name name is Josh. That's and correct. I'm, probably, I, I'm a person who likes first names. So I'm probably going to use your first name quite a lot. Today. I prefer that you did. Okay. Yeah, because not, I'm not going to call you... LT Demps or something like well, that. The channel name's Liam and my name's Liam. I made it easy for everyone. No, I sure, but like <laughs> War, War Hipster started as like a screen name for me on Instagram. Yeah. And as like a half a joke from somebody. I who, think a lot of people do that though, to be fair. Yeah. A lot of people start with that some like my first YouTube channel name was Morehammer. Because I, I, I needed some catchy YouTube channel name, I thought, and I and I hated it. I have to no time at all. Yeah. And it was like, oh it's it's Morehammer. I was like, oh, I don't really like it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Quite like I changed it. Yeah, so I, I don't mind it as a as a like a as a as a greeting or someone yelling at me from across <laughs> a, from across a concourse, yeah. but like you know, we're just talking. To, you know, I am Josh. That's, yeah, that's my name. So, so uh, we've kind of given it away. Josh has his own YouTube channel called War Hipster, or is it the War Hipster or War Hipster? Yeah, it's just War Hipster. Just War Hipster. Uh, it will be linked in the video description below, alongside his Instagram page and stuff like that. So check out all the links, hit all the follows, and all that kind of stuff. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, on the day of filming, yesterday, uh, we were live in the studio and we went over 60,000 subscribers, so clearly great content. Uh, if you're after painting tutorials, specifically brush painting and moreover using contrast paints, it's definitely the channel to check out on YouTube, in my opinion. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, but go show Josh some love. His content's incredible. And I said this to you on stream last night, and I mean it genuinely. Mm. It, was, it, was the con it was your content that got me kind of back into looking at and watching painting tutorials. So in the early days, I watched the GW ones, when, particularly when it was uh, Duncan and then Peachy and Duncan. Uh, and then they both left, and I felt that they, this is a personal opinion, I felt the GW painting tutorials just got a bit worse. Uh, and there was a number of reasons. They felt a bit flatter. Um, they, 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 were, they felt less like there was a personality behind it. And I'll be straight up and think, I'll be honest and say, I think some of the paint jobs were worse as well. I didn't like the painting tutorials so much. But one of the reasons why I originally liked what they were doing over on the Warhammer YouTube channel was because it was quite clear mm. they were using just digital paints. So it was, for me, at least, it was very relatable. I have a bunch of digital paints. I don't really have much from anything else. I have a few, like Vallejo and stuff. Um, it was an easy guide to follow. They gave me a list of all the paints at the start, and they showed me the brushes I needed to use, and they showed me the process, and they showed me a little bit each time. It, I didn't feel like at any stage got bogged down mm. and got boring, um, and I felt like it was something... I followed some of their guides, and it, they were repeatable. Yeah. Now, I, when I found your channel and started watching your content, I would go as far as to say it ticked every single box that I've just mentioned. Mm. I assume that was done by design. Yeah. So I kind of, there's, there's two kind of streams of thought with the way I make videos. One, it's, the, it's, it's what I'm comfortable with using, how I've gained the stuff. And then there's also the contextual stuff around the world for the audience, right? So I, I do use Citadel paints for mm. Citadel miniatures. 
because nine times out of ten, if it's somebody's first model kit or they're early in their Warhammer career or whatever, they'll have gone into Games Workshop, they'll have bought that and they'll have looked on the back and they'll have gone, oh, I'll buy some Citadel paints to go with that. It's very different to kind of any other space, I think, like any other hobby that's like this, where you might, you might go and buy the model kit, but you've done a load of research on wanting to get it, that model kit in the first place. So yeah. if, you're, if you're getting into something like Bolt Action, for example, there aren't Bolt Action stores. No. Where Bolt Action sells Bolt Action miniatures and there's Bolt Action staff and they have test games for Bolt Action yeah. and they sell Bolt, Bolt Action, Action paints. Yeah. And they sell Bolt Action paints. Only Games Workshop has that kind of accolade yeah. of that they do everything and it's all in one place. Mm-hmm. So it's that kind of destination store, which is part of the reason why their retail offering still survives because it is a destination store. It's everything you need in one place, not everything that they sell. Yeah. I think some people would prefer if it was that way, but I get why it isn't. If you get everything in one place, nine times out of ten, during your first year, I would say, you are only ever buying from Games Workshop. Agreed. You might then find a, like a, like an element or a Firestorm Games or something like that where it has that kind of discount because you might go and look on the internet or you can't get into town one day. You go and look on the internet and you go, oh, you can get it for 20% off here. Great you'll still stick within that kind of product space, yeah. I think. And so it's only after a while of you've spent more time on the internet or you've kind of made more hobby friends in the community where they might say, oh, I, I actually tried out Pro Acryl's Titanium White, whatever it's called, for my white paint. And they go, okay, well, that's a trusted source is telling me that as I can purchase that so I can use that to replace my white scar. Yeah, I mean, you, yes. So I, I, I've been in the hobby for an incredibly long time. Mm-hmm. You know, the channel itself has been is six, seven years old. I've been in the hobby for, for decades now. Yes. And I would say I've only started using alternative branding of paints in perhaps the last maybe three years. Mm-hmm. And even then, I had trusted sources for ages telling me, use the Vallejo Metallics, for example. This is an actual example. Use the Vallejo Metallics, for example, because they're just better. And I, it took me so long to like, but I know Citadel. Yes. I know uh, what was bolt gun metal. I know that color. Yeah, yeah. I know Retributor armor. I know Balthazar gold. I know these colors. So I could pick up the Vallejo offerings. Could. And a, and a person who uses them says they're great. But I also feel like sometimes some people, there's, I, think, I feel like there's two types. Sometimes some people just kind of just want to be different. And then it's yeah. kind of, well, actually, maybe it's not as good, but he wants to be different. He wants to be like, I'm not just buying because I want to be different. Um, and I think sometimes other people just like to defend a decision even if they might be wrong. <laughs> like... Oh, 100%. It happens all the time. We all do it. We all do things like that in, yeah. in every walk of life. But you, you, are, you are absolutely correct there. Like you, know, you know how that paint works. Mm. So there are a lot of people who don't make YouTube videos or aren't on social media who will only use Citadel. Or they might have never used a single Citadel paint in their life. They use Humbrol but they use the same paints they use for their Airfix models that they also use to paint. But they trust it. They know them. They but trust they it. trust the brand and they know how it works. And kind of going into a new space can be uh, difficult, especially if you are aware of your skill mm. level or you believe you have a certain skill level. To change a tool within that can upset the apple cart. 100%, yeah. And that is, that is something that you don't want to give people that anxiety following one of your videos, yeah. which is... To get back to the original question, part of the reason why I am pretty much Citadel only when I'm doing Citadel miniatures, I have done a couple of videos about similar one coat solutions like contrast paint for Vallejo Express colors, and then I did do a tutorial on how to paint a crypt guard yeah. with. But that was a all of my contrast tutorials are called Contrast Plus. That was a Vallejo Express uh, Exp- Express okay. Plus tutorial, and then I used. I think I used maybe one or two shades from Citadel because I just don't have a huge Vallejo range. But otherwise, the rest of it was all Vallejo paint. We've, I mean, we've kind of skipped a step here, so I'm yeah. gonna we'll wind it back a little bit. Um, so we, we obviously we, we welcomed him to the video and said Mr. Lips has got his own channel. So how long has the channel been going for now? July 2019. I oh, okay, think, is when I kicked it off. So less than five years. Yes. And we we said we've just got over sixty thousand subscribers. Yeah. So it's going okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been very slow, 
but I think that's because of, you know, I think if you were to if you were to compare sixty thousand subscribers over five years to what you would deem successful YouTubing, not just wargaming, but successful YouTubing, you would say that was slow. But I think in the U, I think in the wargaming space, that's been pretty good. Oh. And I think it's because well, no, 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 because that's a channel that launched in 2017 <laughs> and has 31,000 subscribers. Yeah, but you're doing all right, mate. Yeah, no, I, but you've had a number of breaks, haven't you? Yes, in oh, that time. Yeah. And as we know, breaks on YouTube are the worst thing you can do. Absolutely murders the channel. Because you can you can get up that steady pace, that steady steam, and then you miss one, and YouTube just goes, oh, you don't love me anymore. Breaks is like starting all over again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Every time. So you just kill all of your growth, which yeah. is why, you know, that is a huge source of anxiety, I think, for create content creators of missing a video, which is why you will see content creators put out a video saying, sorry, I don't have a video this week. Yeah, but at least I'm putting out a video. But I'm putting a video yeah. out so that YouTube doesn't, you know, cast me off like a spurned lover. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so start in 2019, what made you start a YouTube channel? The reason I started the YouTube channel was because Contrast Paint came out. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, you, mm. so Contrast Paint came out, and everyone said it was terrible. I, I was one of those people. Straight up, 100% one yeah. of those people. Yeah. We talked about this last night. Uh, I went into my local games workshop, Southampton, incredible store. A guy called Rod manages it, incredible manager. He's been the manager for 20 years or something. He's been there for ages, right? Mm. And they had this new, amazing, does everything paint. Now, I am horrific with painting, typically for a number of reasons. Um, some of it is, is stuff that I've actually discovered in recent years. We'll talk a little bit about this, actually, uh, probably throughout the show. Um, over the course of the last four or five years, myself, I've been on my own sort of little journey of discovery because of my children and with COVID and lockdown, we had the kids at home and all that mm. kind of stuff. Um, and, and kind of discovered, and to, I think most people that have known me for a very long time, they'll be like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> that I've got wild ADHD. I, I struggle to focus on a single task. I, I flip tasks. And I have to really force myself to, struggle, to focus on a single task. Yeah. Um, I'm like that with the hobby. Now, since having the channel, having the element sponsorship, getting preview content from Games Workshop, that's kid in a candy store. Mm. So, like, I'm just about building this model, and I'm just about finished building it, and Games Workshop goes, here's this brand new, shiny, amazing thing yep. that no one else knows about yet. You're like, ooh, and you start <laughs> doing that one. And then before you know, you just see a plastic of boxes, and I never get anything finished. Yeah. So when they announced the, uh, before, actually, interestingly, before I had the channel, I painted armies. I had painted armies that were mine that I'd done. Since having the channel and tons of access to the hobby, it's, got, it's made it worse. So when they announced this, does everything paint? I looked into it. I was quite interested in it myself because mm. I was like, if this speeds my process up, then I'm going to use it, obviously. I uh, went into the local games workshop. They had a sea of, of grey seer and wraith bone sprayed uh, easy to build space marines yep. and a, loads of contrast paints. And they handed me a big thick brush and went, gloop it on. So I did. And glooped it on and then let it set and was like, that looks awful. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> These are not good paints. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my experience. Yeah, and I think, I think that was a. So I've talked about this quite a lot. That I think that was an error of judgment from them, but at the same time they weren't wrong. It is a one coat paint solution. You don't have to thin it down. You can just glob it on, and, yep. and you get your model done. You get you can get your model done super quick using it. Absolutely, you can. Where the fall down in communication is is when you say. When your when your kind of attitude towards painting advice for a long time, so like from Duncan and stuff like that, was two thick coats. You remember one of the taglines for contrast was one thick coat. But you're putting in people's head this idea that two thick coats is what you get. Two thin coats, sorry. You get two thin coats and you get that really lovely colour. Now you don't have to do that. It's that one thin coat, one thick coat. <laughs> words. <laughs> you do that one thick coat and that's what you'll get. Yeah. There's, that's the, the the bit that's missing from that marketing is one thick coat and this is what you'll get. Yeah, is the it puts in your head the idea that you'll get that parade ready. Not quite heavy metal, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's a completely different style, but you'll get the thing that looks like the box art, and it's just not true. Yeah. However, it is possible to do it with the paints, as I think by now, eight hundred videos later, I might have uh, <laughs> might have proved. So. The reason I started the channel was because I didn't have any of that kind of sort of like public marketing for it. I saw the videos that they were talking about. I saw the things that they were saying that it could do, and I was really excited by that. But I didn't have a staff member or a retail staff member telling me what I should do with it. 
My first experience of it was I went to go and visit a friend of mine in Nottingham. He got all of the paints on day of release. Okay. And we sat down and we said, what would be fun to do with these paints? And we said, let's build the, do you remember the Wrath and Rapture box? Mm Mm-hmm. Which had Slanesh demons and Chaos demons in it. Yep. Uh, Chaos demons? They're all Chaos demons. Corn demons. Yeah. Slanesh demons and corn demons. I said, he said, wouldn't it be fun if we could paint this whole box in a day? And I was like, yeah, that would, but that's insane. Who are you? And he was like, well, let's do, we'll try it and we'll have a go with the paints. And we just opened the paints up and we just got into it using them our way. Yeah. No one telling me what to do. No guides, nothing. I was just using them my way. And I was like, this has changed the game. Completely yeah. changed the game. I don't have to add water. I don't have to thin it down on the palette. I don't have to do two thin coats. I don't have to worry about pale colours and dark colours and this, that and the other. Of course, if I make mistakes, I can have to go and find a way to correct them. I hadn't figured all that out yet. I wasn't thinking about that in the future, but I was like, I was a very p- precise painter for a long time. The way I used to paint miniatures way, way back was I would prime them black and then I would avoid the gap. Like, you know, like a space marine army with armor where there's a little square in it. I would just avoid the black. I wouldn't shade anything. I would just avoid the black. So a lot of my earlier models looked like comic books. Yeah, quite high contrast. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I've got that skill of being precise with the brush anyway. And so I sat down with these paints and I was just painting away with them. And I was really enjoying it. We look up eight hours later and I finished the entire Slanesh half and he's finished half of the entire corn half. And I was like, this is a complete game changer. He then went away because I was looking after his animals for a couple of days. And um, he just sat me with the paints. And I'd taken some of my own models with me. I took 10 Blood Angels Space Marines. Okay. And a Terminator Captain, one of the anniversary ones mm-hmm. with two power fists or whatever it was. Um, and he had a pile of other Slanesh demons. He was like, well, you've done them. You might as well do them as well. And I was like, I might as well. Um, <laughs> So across that weekend, I probably painted somewhere in the region of about 60, 70 models in about three days. Yeah. Previously, I would probably have done about five, ten in that time. And from that alone, I was just impressed. I was, I was immediately impressed by the tool. And because I was using contrast paint so much, I wasn't looking at the internet. I was on the train ride home when I was looking at the internet and everyone was trashing the product everywhere. I was like, I don't understand what people's experience with it. My experience and your experience is completely different. Yeah. And I watched a bunch of YouTube videos where they were doing exactly as they were told and then criticizing the result. So I didn't think there was any critical thought that was being applied to said product in terms of, it's not like if I came up with a brand new range of base and layer paints. If I sent them to you and I said, yeah, yeah you should only have to do one, one thick coat with them. If you went, cool, all over the thing, I went, yeah, it looks like trash. People would be like, well, obviously, you would still thin it down with a little bit. Of There's all that implied knowledge yes, there. Yes, of that course, kind of yeah, thing. absolutely. So I think that for me was a huge thing. And so and then I was posting, I was posting pictures of them on Instagram, and people were like, how did you do these? And I went, oh, they're all contrast paint. And people were like, no, they're not. <laughs> yeah. I'd have been one of those people, though. Yeah, you probably were. I, I, I would have been one of those people early days because yeah. of because of the experience. And I think that to some extent, it's obviously a GW marketing faux pas that they, and they do this a lot though, to be honest with you, they, they've released something and they haven't actually shown you properly how to use it or told you how to use it. They, I feel like if they'd have given us, if they'd have just simply picked different models in mm-hmm. the store, if you'd have picked something that was kind of more fleshy based or fur based or something like that, and they'd give you that. So I, I recently followed one of your contrast tutorials on the Striking Scorpions that got released in the Kill Team box. Yeah. Now, Striking Scorpions are still armored warriors, but because they're elder armored warriors, the armor, the armor plates are a lot smaller. There's a lot more detail and recesses and stuff like that. Yeah. The contrast paint on those is so much better than a space marine, yes, especially a Primaris right. marine as well. Which a Primaris marine has even less in terms of like nooks, crannies, and and, and stuff than a, an old fashioned tactical marine did. So if they'd have given you something akin to a, a striking scorpion, even, mm. but if they'd have gone down the route of a corn demon and used the red one and a slash demon used the purple one and, and whatever, I think people would have had a different experience, even using the stick it on straight away. Yeah. And like, this, like I said earlier, uh, earlier, they're not wrong. They just chose, they chose a specific subset of their customer base to market them to. Yeah. And like, look, I mean, that's a, it's an absolutely glorious idea to say to somebody, 
who is completely brand new. That's it. That you just and it's and it's and it's yeah. done and it looks great. You don't have to worry about any of the other thing. It's basically like you can do the base and layer thing that you'll see in all of our videos currently, um, but this replaces that. This is your starter product, and I think. When you market something specifically to starters, but then you ask experienced people to review it and then pretend that they're a starter, they'll pretend that they're a starter and they'll forget that it's being marketed as a starter product, and so they'll then give it the expert critical eye. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, you then go, "Yeah, this is this is a bag of crap." As I say, like it's like things like uh, a great example of that is like the mold line remover. Mold line remover is a fantastic tool. Most people use the who have been around for a while will use the back of their hobby knife because it's just a little bit more precise. I've heard people go, yeah, it's a, it's a waste, of, waste of money, it's a piece of crap, and it's like, and it's not, it's actually really, really, very, it's, very good. Yeah. And just because you use the back of the model knife, because that's better for you, because you've learnt that, and I've learnt that in recent times, like, oh yeah, no, I, I can get on with this, I mean, they don't have to have three or four things on my desk, I have two. I'm like, this is great. So, yeah, contrast paint. But I, I mean, I use an actual hobby knife that's been blunted over time. Yeah. When it gets to, when, I, when my hobby knife gets to the point where it's blunt, that becomes my mold line remover. Yeah. But that's because that's what I know. I've used the mold line remover, by the way. Fantastic tool. Yeah, really, really they, are, they are. They're wonderful. I think, I think another thing they did around the release of contrast as well, which I, I would argue was a slight marketing mistake, uh, is I think they kind of marketed it at, like, it's borderline idiot proof. And I, I mean, no offense to anyone out there, but what, what it is is literally you just do what you want with it and it will look good. Which mm. is just not the case as well. I, like contrast, what I found with contrast, at least uh, since I've started using it recently, and I started using it recently after finding your channel and your videos, is that actually with some time and practice, it then starts to look like the stuff that you're putting on your channel. Yeah. If I, when I first started with it, I had some horrific patches, some horrific areas, some bad pooling. I had bits where, because the paint, what it does is it contracts. So I had some bits where it contracted and you still saw the base layer through. And then when you try and put more contrast over, it, then it looks weird because you've, you've plugged a gap that shouldn't be there. It's like a highlighter pen. So yeah, you kind of have to work. Yes, yeah. exactly like a highlighter pen. So then you kind of have to make sure you work with it whilst it's wet. And once I've gained, now I've gained some experience with it and I've used it a little bit more and I feel like I'm in a better place with that paint. I'm like, okay, now I'm starting to see some of the cool results that yeah. I thought I would see when it first was marketed. Because when it was first marketed, they did just tell you, you basically go, like that, let it dry, done. Yeah. And, and I, I, what I also found was it kind of, it was also marketed as you don't have to be neat, but you do. Because if you have, for example, an armored warrior with a robe and you want the robe to be red and the armor to be blue, well, then you have to be neat. Because yes. you need to not get the red on the blue, because if you put the blue over the red, it's gonna, it's gonna be different color because it works like highlighter pens. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, it's, it's the, the mistake was marketing it as, and look, I still, I still to this day get comments going, this isn't how you use this paint. <laughs> and I'm like, y y yes, yes it is. Because it's, it's a way to use the thing. So any tool can be used for multiple different things. Yeah. You've already talked about it. Your hobby knife can be used to cut. It can also be used to smooth down mold lines. It's two ways to use the tool. You can't just say that you can't do that just because you're not allowed yeah so like the same thing the same thing with paint paint is a tool paint is a tool to get your models looking like you want them to yeah absolutely and so this is where there's a, such a strange stubbornness i think and i think it's i think it's almost gone now but there are still kind of subsections of the of the community that will only ever believe their first impression about something but a base paint from citadel a bad and black, as an example, is a base paint. How many times do you see in the heavy metal um, uh, recipes where they go, use a, use a wash of a bad and black? I don't know. So it's a base paint that gets thinned all the way down and then it's used as a, as a shade. Or how many times, you know, things like when people talk about glazing, non-metallic metal, oh, all I'll, this kind I of thing. I will things. glaze with any colour. Yeah, yeah. So it's a layer, a layer paint is used for layering, but it can also be turned into a shade, it can be turned into mm. a glaze, it can be used as a highlight, spot highlight, it can be used for object source lighting, it can be used for dry brushing, all of these things. That one tool can be used for a different, number of different techniques. It's not just, well now I can only use it as, as the next layer up. Because if that was the case, all the paints would be uh, attached to a very specific process within painting. You'd have your base paints, have your shade paints, 
You have your layer paint, then you'd have your highlight do you think, paint. Do you think this is a, a potential um, a potential issue with the, ga the way Games Workshop sells markets or labels its products? Because I, I found that, let's come away from painting for a brief moment and talk about the game 10th edition, right? Um, currently, the only really way we have to play 10th edition is Leviathan. There's a single mission in the rule book, um, but really we only have Leviathan. Um, and the, the, I feel like the community in general is screaming for more ways to play the game. Mm. Well, actually, there's a million ways to play the game because you can literally make anything you want up and you can play that game. You can build custom scenarios with friends. Um, you, can, you can just play, kill each other. You can do anything you want. That's the beauty of this hobby. But because actually Games Workshop right now doesn't provide a way labelled as narrative play necessarily or open war or maelstrom of war or whatever it might be, people don't, don't use the rule set for those purposes. Mm. Now, I'd argue that perhaps Paint then sits in a similar, in a similar realm for war gamers. I don't, know if, I don't know if it's just war gamers specifically, but it's like they've told me that this is my dry brush paint. So these are the only paints I can use for dry brushing. This is my base paint, so I must use a base paint as my base. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's possible, but then that's symptomatic of every single... I mean, Vallejo do Vallejo game colour. Does it? Or Model Air. You do Model Air as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like... Mm, What's game color? Can I only use but, it for painting games? But I asked the person if I, I asked a friend of mine once, could I put game color through the airbrush? And he went, Yeah. I said, But it's not air, bro. It's not air. Yeah. He was like, yeah, Because you can. Yeah. So <laughs> I, think, I think it's less the companies having to hold our hands. I think it's the slow death of imagination. <laughs> well, yeah, well, absolutely. But, but what I'm, where I'm going with it is if they removed the base air uh, layer dry brush, and just had the colour name, mm. maybe, just maybe, people would be more open to using Abaddon Black as a shade or, you know, I don't know. Possibly. I, I think it's divided up quite nicely now. Oh, I, I like, I, I uh, yeah, like I, I, the way it is. And I think, I think it, it, it's, it's idiot-proof until, until, you, until you kind of... Be stubborn about it. I think it, I think it depends on how you approach the names, though. So I, when yeah. I look at a, 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 a paint that says base paint, I just know that the pigment's slightly thicker. It's yeah. going to go on smoother with less applications because it's a thicker pigment, essentially. Uh, if it says layer, I'm like, okay, this is slightly more translucent. So I don't actually go. I don't look at layer and go, I can only use this for layering. I just go, it's a slightly more translucent paint. Yeah. Um, I think if you do that, when it says dry brush, I know, it's, I know the paint is going to be kind of more coagulated. It's not going to be so runny because it's more of a powderish almost than yeah. paint. Um, and I think if people apply that to the, what, the, what base actually means and what layer actually means, it opens up a lot more possibilities for what you can do with your, with yeah. your tools. So, contra so contrast is why you started the channel. Yeah. But what was kind of the intent and purpose? Was it because you wanted to show people this paint that you just had? So you just said you had that experience on Instagram. Everyone yeah. said it was terrible. You're like, I'm going to prove the world wrong. Did you have a, a desire to get into tutorial painting? Was it just uh, and teaching people? Was it just I want to show people what I'm doing? Like what? What was so contrast was why you started, but what was the kind of the intention with the channel? It it, it was a kind of all of the above. Oh, okay. So I was getting a lot of questions on Instagram of people saying, "How did you do this?" Mm. And I was sick of typing it out. <laughs> So I was like, make a video. <laughs> People can just watch that, and then I don't have to talk to anyone because yeah. I'm, you know, I love talking to people, but you know, at a certain point, if yeah. you spend all day texting, don't do any painting. So I was like, I want to paint, yeah. <laughs> and I can't do this when I'm doing. First, it's a layer of blood angels red over grey sea primer, and then I do this, and then I do that. So yeah. firstly, it was one. I was typing it out, and I didn't want to. I want to make videos anyway. I wanted to make a video just to just to show people how I, to answer those questions. And the other side of it was kind of just, I was frustrated that everyone was really down on something that I really liked. Yeah. And I wanted to prove that it could be done and possibly contribute something positive to the world about something that I couldn't understand what people like, nope, never use it, it's rubbish, it's awful, it's never going to work. And I was like, it's made everything for me easier. Yeah. And that feeling for me really just kick-started my love of painting miniatures, but also painting miniatures that I never normally would have been comfortable doing before. Yeah. My two armies, two main armies, I guess, from later years were Blood Angels and Stormcast Eternals. They're big, blocky armor panels. It's about where everybody starts, and it's just like, you know, paint the color on, 
gate it. It's quite forgiving, it. quite forgiving, Very models forgiving to paint, stuff. Yeah. yeah. And you'd look at stuff, well, I would look at stuff that, you know, where you'd see like kind of like blending, just like a thing where it moves from like a horn or a tusk or something where it moves from brown into bone. And I'm like, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to achieve that. And suddenly I had this range of paints where all of that was possible. Yeah. And I was like, the models I've always wanted to do, but never had confidence, I now feel confidence that I could achieve those. And so it's like models like Archeon. I would never have tried that without, con with contrast, without contrast paint. No chance. Yeah. Because I'd never have been able to do it justice. Mm -hmm. It would never have looked the way I wanted it to look. It would never have looked like the box art, how I love my models to look. Because I go, they go, here's this beautiful thing that we've painted. And I go, cool, I want to copy it. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I don't really like, I don't, it's not that I don't like it. It's just that I don't really go in for kind of custom paint jobs for my armies. I don't, I don't need that. I like to make my things look like they look in the story. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think, I think, I think everybody that, to some extent, everybody that's involved in the hobby has a bit of an affinity for box art anyway. Yeah. Because and it's your first, it's the first thing you see when you pick up that box of miniatures or you grab hold of that box from the store, the first thing you see is box art yeah. every time. And that's your first impression of that model normally. And even if they show it on a Warhammer, nowadays they show it on the Warcom community page or something like that, it's going to be the same artwork. It's the same paint scheme as the box art typically. So I think any, I mean, I, I've got, I've no issue with custom schemes. I'm sure you don't as well. But I think no one out there can honestly say I have no interest in box art. I think, especially certain models as well. If you look at a Dante, or you mm. look at a, a Mephiston, or you look at uh, Archaeon, or you look at those sorts of models, you're like, well, really, they should be box art? Yeah. It, that's, just, that's my attitude. And I have no issues with people that want to play Dante Black and say he's gone Death Company. Cool, yeah. go for it. It's, it's cool as Absolutely. hell. Absolutely. But there's something about box art, Dante, for me, that's yeah. a little bit special. Yeah, and so then when you look at, like, so like I think one of the, the biggest ones I've done recently, Usheran. Um... There's so much going on with him. He's fundamentally he's not actually that difficult or big a model, but there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening on that model. Like there's the rich red of his cape that fades into the dirt of the of it being decrepit and having dragged along the ground. His skin itself goes from this blue into this pale green on his fingers and this, that, and the other. Before contrast paint, never would have attempted it. Yeah. It would have been a flat colour that would have had highlights. And that would have given me a perfectly satisfactory amount of joy, but not like I get from using contrast paint. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no idea. A, a good one I can think of is like uh, Sigvald the Magnificent. He's got that sort of blendy thing going on on his mirror shield, and he's got like loads of, loads of different colours all, all over Sigvald. And again, never would have attempted it. I would never have, never have gone... And looked at a video, uh, looked at a model like that, and gone, "Ooh, I want to try non-metallic metal." Yeah, because I, I don't want to try that because to me that's that that's too complicated and it adds way too many layers to the painting stage. When ultimately I can achieve something that looks almost as good if it's a different style of thing, like true metallic metal or whatever, or just using metallic paints, I can achieve that with my contrast paint. I think when it comes to like the blending stuff as well, the interesting difference I think is because I have done a ton of blending without using contrast. Mm. Um, typically things like power weapons. Um, we talked about this with James when he was on the show. Um, I One of my favourite things to do is blend power weapons. Mm. I, I love it. The um, the transition I can get from a dark blue to a light blue and then a light blue to a dark, a, a dark blue to a light blue and it looks like a power weapon. It looks similar to something um, that it, I recently showed Kyle some photos. Like, Look, I did these and he's like, oh, you can do it. I was like, yeah, I can do it. Yeah. But... And I like, I like, I enjoy the process. I like the process, but it takes a very long time. Mm. It takes a very long time for me to do that. Um, and then I watch you do it with contrast. I like, just do this, do this, drag it together, and I'm like, yeah, it looks yeah. almost the same. Yeah, and it took you like five minutes. It, exactly the point. <laughs> exactly the point. So like, grey knights. Grey knights are always a thing I always go back to. I used to have a grey knight army. I then didn't have a Grey Knight army anymore, but I kept some figures of it. So yeah. I, kept, I kept, I still have them. I have a brother, Captain Stern, and five metal, these metal ones, metal Grey Knights. Oh, wow. Knights. Old, old Grey Knights. Yeah. First iteration I painted them when I was a kid, the blades were silver. Actually, not even that. I scraped all the primer off because the under, because they were metal. Oh. Yeah. They were metal. I like it. So I just I'm left, kind of into that. I just left the bare metal. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that looks great. No, one, no one's going to do that. 
Look at look at how shiny and metal my swords are. Yeah. It looks awful. Well, no, it, I mean it does look awful, but you know, that was that was what fourteen year old me thought was cool. Yeah. Then I reprimed I stripped them when I was twenty five. Mm-hmm. So they were like that for <laughs> ten years. Um I then stripped them when I was twenty five and I tried again. And I went and did the um uh the Duncan method. Tried to do the Duncan method of the glazing, this, that and the other, and I just couldn't get the hang of it. Because I couldn't get my, my thinned ratios right. And I was like, it doesn't look like I'm doing anything. So I kept applying more and more paint to the point of yeah. where you just have these hard lines at those transitions. So it looked like that. So you'd have that light blue, dark blue, yeah. light blue, dark blue. But it was like a hard line there. There was barely any transition there whatsoever. And I was like, yeah, that looks fine. And then in order to cover some of that up, I then put white lightning stripes all over it. And I was like, it looks like trash. Then cycle forward to when the Castell and Crow model came out having learned everything I'd learned from contrast paint in the intervening time, um, I did all of that stuff. So I did Stripe Marines, I've done uh, Voldus recently. I did a Nemesis Dread Knight with the sword. did all of that with contrast paint, and I was like, no, like you said, it's put that first coat on, and then once that's dry, I'm just going to thin one down, just put it on, and then just wick it off a little bit at the end, transition right there. And I was like, I'm, I am streets ahead of where I was. yeah. And I've, I, you said we've been doing this for decades. I've been doing this since I was six. I'm 33. <laughs> I have never had as big a leap in my ability as I have when Contrast Paint came out. Yeah. And so that feeling for me is something I wanted to give other people. Do you, do you think that some of your content, at least over the course of the last four and a half years, is also literally you showcasing your kind of journey of learning and mm. going, oh, hey, I can do this thing now and I can do this thing now? Absolutely. Absolutely. My stuff, is, my stuff has changed and got more simpler. Some stuff's got more difficult based on, I've been, I, didn't, I didn't get the contrast paint range and was immediately a fully fledged pro. I think it's easy for people to think that though. Yeah, no, no. I, 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 I think you, whenever you see someone with a talent that you might appreciate and you're, they're showcasing it for you or they're teaching you something to do, it's easy to think that that person has all of the answers and they're already at the pinnacle of the game and that they're not also still learning alongside you. So, you, so you'd say you're still, you're still learning 100%. as well? 100%. Even still just learning. with contrast? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Oh, wow. Great example of that is, um, you know, all the new Dark Angel stuff that came out? Yeah. All of their swords have got this kind of, non-metallic metal, true metallic metal, whatever it is, I get confused between the two. It's just something that I don't really want to kind of delve too deeply into. You know how they all kind of go from like a, there's there's the shadows of the black of the blade into like a, into into a silver. Mm -hmm. And it's got that lovely kind of almost mirror sheen on that. I was like, I haven't figured out how to do that. I figured out how to do it for Nemesis Force weapons because it's just blue. There's no metal in it whatsoever. It's just a blue weapon. That's fine. Same for Adeptus Custodes weapons. They generally don't tend to have metal in them. It's just a blue energy blade, like a lightsaber almost at that point. But this thing was something slightly different. And I was like, well, what if we go for the same principles, but we start from a metallic base, and we're just using one color for the shadow. So black Templar thins down, and then we blend that into the silver then we need to punch the silver back up. So what if we then just go for a, a metallic glaze? But again, and same, same principle, you apply it over that one bit, and then you just do what I normally do with the contrast paint, then you get it. It's now my new favourite power sword recipe. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That good? I've done it on all the Deathwing Knights, all the Inner Circle Companions, Asmodai, Belial, done it on all of them, and I'm like, it looks phenomenal. And I'm not going to do it on every sword going forth, because not every sword on the box art is like that. I can be really guilty of, of, a, of doing that. I can be really guilty of finding some new technique that I like, mm. some airbrush recipe. So I, do a lot, I actually quite like doing a lot of airbrushing. Mm. Um, and I'll be honest with you, um, your, your tutorials have got me painting again, genuinely, but I've actually kind of gone back to using my airbrush quite a lot now. Because I like airbrushing, personally. Um, but sometimes I can find a specific recipe that I do and then I go, that looks really nice. And then somehow I'll try and apply it to every single faction all the time. Yeah. And everything looks the same and it doesn't work. Um, I think that, that's something that people, I think people often, I would encourage people to try and challenge themselves a little bit. If you find a power sword recipe that you like that looks really, really nice across your Grey Knights, don't necessarily put it on all your Dark Angels or put it on all your uh, Eldar. Try something slightly different. Yeah. Put it on your Necrons. Yeah. Um, 
And actually on your channel, you showcase lots of different ways of doing a similar item, which I think is, is quite nice for people. Mm. Uh, I also like the fact that, so I, 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 I assume this, is this, I don't know if this is a recent thing or this is something you've done forever. If you've watched any of Josh's recent tutorials, you go, step, 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 done, here's battle ready. Yes. Which, um, which look, how do I, I I'm not going to say this, I won't be polite, fuck it. it. It looks medium. It doesn't look amazing. Yeah. It doesn't look terrible. It looks medium, right? It looks cool. I, I often look at battle ready, I'm like, mm, I wouldn't be happy with that. But then you go on and do the next part of the video. And at the end of it, it then looks incredible. And it's, what's really interesting is twofold for me. First, about it, it kind of showcases how the, the foundation is so incredibly important to do the next steps. And you have to kind of get that right, I think. Mm. But secondly, I think we all, go th we all go through this process. The amount of times I go through the process of painting a model and I get to a stage, maybe 30, 40, 50% of the way through, where I'm like, this looks meh at best. Yeah. It's not great. And often I'm guilty of stopping at that point and going, it's a lost cause. I want to do something different now. Because yeah. I feel like this isn't going to look like I want it to look like. And what your videos did for me was, was genuine, and I, I mean this as a genuine compliment, was look at a model and be like, it doesn't look that great right now. And I watched the rest of the video and go, now it looks really good. Mm. Have you always done that? Have you always done battle ready and then finished? Or did you start off simpler? So it's kind of twofold. The, the way Duncan and that used to make videos is when they did like, recipes like when they you remember they used to do the like tips on a thursday or whatever and that was where they'd select a community question so someone would like it would be like steve from bolton wants to know how you paint raptors space marine armor so we're going to do that and then they would do what they would do in that is they would go up to that it's shaded and it's they wouldn't call it at that time because i don't think the, the the terminology was there yet at that time when they were doing that but they would get it to battle ready and then they would add some highlights to finish off that recipe so when I first started making videos, I was kind of copying that. So I would be like, we're going to do all the armor. So we're doing, we're going to add the red and then we're going to, well, I didn't use shades because they weren't contrast paints anymore. But um, at the time, but we're going to do all the Blood Angels red and then we're going to highlight it. Yeah. Then we're going to do all of the black, then we're going to highlight it. Then we're going to do it. And I was following that recipe before. But then I thought, actually, let's transition that slightly to let's get the whole thing up to that battle ready standard so that we can then from that point move beyond so that's the plus in the contrast plus of my branding oh okay yeah so contrast that's all your base you get it up to that war hipster battle ready as i call it and then you go but well, i mean i do it every single time so i go with all those shades applied which is now what i would call a war hipster battle ready but we're not going to leave it there we're going to take it to the next <laughs> level and we're going to do that by adding some and if I'm going to do layers or glazes, I'll say that, layers or glazes, and we're going to add some highlights. Yeah. And then we move on from that point. And the whole, the whole reason for that was it made more sense, I think. Oh, it absolutely makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. So rather than kind of going, okay, we've got all the green up to this perfect level, now what happens if I make a mistake on it? Exactly, exactly why it makes more sense. Yeah, which is why I paint them the way I do. I yeah. get, them all, get them all up to that level, and then if I have to make corrections, I will also put that in the video. Because I, you know, you, I'm not a perfect painter. Some of the best content GW puts out is when they showcase that he he slipped, yeah. and this is how I'm going to correct it. Yeah, and I think that that's like because so I think often with GW's painting tutorials, at least, is you can go. So we're going to paint all of the gold details, and you watch him paint the really obvious gold detail, and you see the really complex gold details all around the edge of the model, <laughs> and it'll go, yeah. whoosh, and they're all done. You're like, oh, just just like that, yeah. just done it all. Yeah. So you don't get to see the angle that he comes in now. And I'm not, no, I don't want to watch every single detail be painted because the video would end up being five hours long. Mm. Um, but then you go, oh, it's all done and it's all perfect, and you're like, there's no way you haven't had to correct. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes showing those corrections and showing that these people are also human and they make mistakes makes you, when you make a mistake, go, well, I'm, they do it. That, you know, mm. So I think it's much, it makes it much normal, much more normal. But yeah, 100% doing the base colours in a group, because I used to follow, like I said to you at the start, I used to follow the GW tutorials and I've been the person who's done that. I've painted the thing up to a level where I'm actually pretty happy. It's not quite as good as perhaps Duncan's done. But I'm quite happy with it. I've gone to the next colour, which is literally adjacent and they, and they film the video, be really careful. It doesn't matter how careful I am. You always when you're do a ham-fisted twat like me, you go, ah. Yeah, well, and it's especially when it's like, when you're painting like infantry, I find that on the first, if you buy like a box of Chaos Space Marines or like Berserkers, Berserkers are a great example. You buy a box of corn berserkers, you will make a mistake on the first one. And that's because you're not aware of what your brush is doing. You won't make the same mistake on the second one. 
or the third one or the fourth one or the fifth one. But it might be that you just got too much paint up in the belly of the brush and that when you're coming around on the coming around on the hip of the trim, you accidentally touch the silver onto the thigh of the other leg and you go, Durr! Um, you know, that, that is a mistake that you end up making. You don't then make it again on the next one, but the first one you do. Yeah. I think a lot of people will buy a box of 10 men, they'll paint one, then they'll paint five, then they'll paint the last four. And the first one's the test to see if it works with the tutorial, um, if they're following a tutorial. If not, they'll go and do the rest of them, um, and yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll get along with it. I think that is what you did that with the striking scorpions, right? Mm -hmm. You did one and then you did the next yep, four the and then you did the next five. Just five yeah, 100% right, you did. Yeah. And so the mistakes you made on the first one, you didn't then make it on the last five. No. Because you learned where you're you subconsciously. Or, or if I did make going. a mistake, what I had to done is I'd worked out how to fix that mistake as well, yes. which was important. Yeah. Um, so the other, thing, the other thing I think I found quite interesting about what you do on your channel in general is um, I have. <laughs> okay. I have seen people apply contrast paint to large flat surfaces such as vehicles. Yes. Right. And uh, in the politest possible way, it's looked fucking horrendous. <laughs> not right? always. Not always. No, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not the only one who's capable of doing it. <laughs> so uh, and I've seen this in the past, and I was like, okay. So when I started to use contrast a little bit, I was like, it's good for detail, fur, skin, flesh, etc., that kind of stuff. And I was always, okay, it's not good for armor. I saw some people do some nice space marines. I was like, it was never be good for big armor. Now, you famously recently painted a Warhound Titan yes. on your channel. Yeah. And you used contrast. Yeah. So you actually do apply it to large, big panels. You've done everything. So, you, so you, would you go as far as to say now that when you're painting, whether for camera or not, you're just using contrast all the time? Always. Really? Every time. I, I'll never not use it. I'll always default to so, it. So your channel is literally a window as to what you're doing at home as well. That's exactly it, yeah. So you, don't, you will never pull out an airbrush, you just use contrast? <laughs> no, oh, really? Always, always contrast paint. Okay. I have an airbrush, it's been used once. And you can see what happened on my channel when I used it. <laughs> I had a, people had this my, the bit I always remember is somebody said, "Oh, you need to clean it now. Just squirt it into the water." And I went, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and I just did that, and it just went everywhere. And it was a great laugh for everybody having it, and I enjoyed myself, and everyone at home enjoyed themselves. That's the only time I've ever used it. Yeah. Because I didn't like it. I was like, I mean, look, it looked great. I love it, airbrush. It did look great, and I was like, oh, this is cool, but this isn't, this isn't accessible for me. This isn't this isn't good for me. I don't like this as a as a as a thing. I also don't want to film this. Yeah. Um. Because, because that's a. Look, I mean, people say you can buy them for a hundred quid, and that's what mine was. Mine was a one hundred pound one. If if I transitioned at that time to doing airbrush tutorials, it would have lasted a month and a half, and then I'd have had to spend three four hundred quid on an actual one that works, and that is always the case with things like that. It's a high performance piece of gear buy a high performance version of it. Don't have to go for the most expensive, don't have to go for the cheapest. Just because you, same thing with 3D printers. People say 3D printers, you can buy really cheap ones and print your armies. It's like, you can, but it will clap out after yeah, 10 yeah, minute yeah. models. What you need to do is buy the one that probably sits in the mid range. And that is well, what I would recommend if that's the transition you're going to make. And so the reason I didn't go into that was because I didn't want to spend 400 pounds on something that I didn't know I liked. Well, I, so, I have, so I have an airbrush set up at home in, yeah. in my garage, which used to be our studio before we had this space. Um, and I mean, I bought my airbrush set up four years ago, five years ago, and I spent a lot of money on it. So I, I would say my airbrush, my compressor combined was a, a total of five to six hundred pounds, I reckon. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago, so I, I don't remember exactly how much. Kyle was recently asking me because his airbrush that he bought broke because the ones that he bought, he was buying kept breaking. Yeah. What's my setup? So I showed it, so I told him. And I, I said to him, he said, when he saw the price, he was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, yes, but I've been using it for five years. Yeah. So it's very good. Now, there is a caveat to that. There was about a six to 12 month period where I just really didn't use it at all mm. because my studio was in my garage and I don't, I, I don't have my airbrush in the house because fumes, you know, children, particles, pets. children, et cetera. Um, so I didn't have it in the house. So what, one of the reasons why I urge, I, always, I genuinely always point people towards your channel for painting tutorials is, I had this I had this experience for the longest time, where I was like, okay, I need, I want to paint um, I want to paint Blood Angel Space Marines, right? Mm. And you'll you'll Google Blood Angel Space Marines, and you'll get the Games Workshop tutorials. But I was like, sometimes I want something that looks a bit nicer or a little bit different. Um, I like the kind of like the, the zenithal kind of look you can get with airbrushing and stuff like that. Although typically I I tend to just do a flat base coat on the whole. If you guys watched the hobby stream I did, I think last week when I'm painting Imperial Night panels, there is a transition that I've done with an airbrush, which is super easy. 
but only easy because I have an airbrush permanently set up now in the yeah. garage, which I didn't have before. So the reason why I point people towards you is because literally you can do it at your desk with just a brush. Yes. I think that's really important in terms of accessibility because too often did I go to a tutorial like the Blood Angels one, you know, four steps for a striking Blood Angels red. Step one, do 18 layers of white and grey with your airbrush. <laughs> yeah. That's well, not step one, is it? That's step one to 18. Yeah, so it's actually 22 <laughs> steps yeah, to get exactly. your thing. Minimum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's, yeah, I, I, you run into that on YouTube all the time. And like, as, again, that, that for me is part of, whilst Games Workshop, I don't know if they still do, they used to sell air paints. I think they do still sell them, right? They don't sell airbrushes. So if it's your first model kit, Picture AOS, the AOS 4 box, whenever that comes out, whatever that looks like, it might be the first time. You might be, you might be 16, you might be eight, all the way from 8 years old to 55 years old, whatever, whatever age you might be. But it might be the first, that is the first time you pick up a model kit. And you get that from the Games Workshop store. And it, you might pick that up from the Games Workshop store because of how good <laughs> that interaction was with that sales staff. Yeah. Or how that made you feel. Or in the case of parents buying it for their kids, how easy they made it sound and showed with the paints that they have at their disposal. You get that home, your first box, and you go, well, I've got to build it all. So, you know, I didn't buy any paints yet because I knew I had to build it all and read about it and understand it, this thing, but I bought the box. You get that home and you go, okay, now I want to paint them and I want to paint them the same filter. Well, I mean, the new ones in the trailer are the AOS 4, the Stormcaster, Hallowed Nights, which is a silver and blue. I want to paint them silver and blue. Let's go and look it up. You then go on the internet and it says, yep, so you've, you've just spent 150, 125, whatever it is on this launch box. Pull out your airbrush and you go and look up how much airbrushes have gone. Suddenly it goes from 150 pounds from the box, 300 pounds for the airbrush, 200 pounds for the compressor, yeah, another 200 pounds for the paint. And it's a skill that you might, like if I said, if I, I think if we went out now and spoke to people and said, do you think you'd be com comfortable using an airbrush? They'd be like, what? If you said, do you think you'd be comfortable using a paintbrush to do something? I think everybody knows that they can, because most people have held a pencil. Yeah. They can pick up a paintbrush and they can just go for it. So the reason I don't use an airbrush is because it's not somebody's first port of call when they join the hobby. There's a hilarious step you're missing as well from that whole process, and that's where they buy their first airbrush, which they typically will probably buy from Amazon cheap. They yep. use it, three days later it breaks. They've then wasted 100 quid because they bought a cheap one. Yeah. <laughs> and at which point, you know, you can, you can have your criticisms of whatever company you have, but that was never Games Workshop's fault. No. That you bought an airbrush and then painting was horrible and this, that, and the other. That was actually the person, that was actually the the YouTuber or whatever, who told you to go and buy yeah. an airbrush, but you, for whatever reason, didn't want to, made the smart decision in this brand new hobby, brand new hobby, to not sink a grand on painting uh, stuff. That's, that's just silly. So, like, there's an argument to be made that what I should do is when it comes to these core boxes, actually buy whatever their new paint set is going to be. Because they always do that, right? They do a, like a, here's 15 paints in a box that you can use to paint this set, is to actually use that for those, those first boxes. That would be ideal because that would show people exactly what you can achieve with all the starter products. But. Yeah, as in I, the, the ones that you get like the three cruel boys and the paints in the box. There's those, those ones. ones, and then there's always a, they have it now as well where it comes with a mold line remover, a brush, mm -hmm. and then there's like yeah. 15 paints. And it, those are intended to get you painting. Uh, like the Command Edition version of AOS. There's an AOS one and there's a 40k one. The, there always is. Um, and it's intended to get you painting either the Ultramarines and the Leviathan term, uh, Tyranids. The Hammers of Sigmar and the Cruel Boys. There's, yeah. There are two sets for that. It's not the full run of paints that you would need to get them looking like they are on the box art. So there's not like Auric Flesh, Baltan Green, and then Nurgling Green, and then Gorse Blood or whatever to do all of the flesh. Not a full recipe. I'm just pulling those names out of my out of my head. But like a great example would be the gold. It'll have retributor armor in it, and it'll have Reichland flash shade in it. It won't have liberator gold, auric armor gold, stormhost silver as well. It does have stormhost silver, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's an argument to be made that that is the ideal video to make. But then at the same time, whilst my videos are designed so that if it was your first model, you have confidence to go in. Um, buy that paint from a place that you know that you, in theory, trust because you've bought products from them already. Yeah. Um, 
that you know it's um it's just that it's that that's the whole point is it's like I have the duty to all the people who have all the sixty thousand people who already subscribed to me who um who it's not their first it's not their first model it's their tenth fifteenth hundredth two hundredth three hundredth model that they've painted alongside with the channel so and I have a very distinctive style as you say there's the battle ready version and there's the parade ready version not that I have I don't actually have a term for it it's just war hipster battle ready finished. <laughs> <laughs> really because I think if I, <laughs> I think if I come up with another term for th that bit it implies that there's then a third step yeah, beyond yeah. that and I don't really want to imply that because there is no once you see it on the screen there's no there's no there's no step beyond that it's done um, would you would you consider your content um, uh, arguably some kind of duty to an audience yes interesting yeah not in the sense that I feel obligated to do it but I feel like I, it's my, it's my, this is sound really, this is going to sound really wanky. I had a feeling of joy, contentment, calmness, all of these things is that what Warhammer painting gives me. I feel like it's my duty to at least enable other people to discover that same type of feeling because of how much it does for me. Okay. As an individual, so so your so the channel then making content, being a content creator, making videos, mm. you suggest that's fun and you enjoy it, yeah. Because I want to touch on something now. Um, you said you don't feel like there's an obligation, but I want to I want to go to a specific moment in time, which was quite recent. Typically, the start of the year, actually. Yeah. There was a video that you released on a Saturday. Yes. It was about the old world. Yes. Um, and we, I mean, we'd spoke before that video came out. Um, because of how late you received those boxes from the Games Workshop. Yeah. So do you want to talk? Do you want to talk through like how you felt at that point? Because I, what I saw when I watched the video, and actually we have the Thanes. By the way, we'll we'll talk to a lot of the Thanes later because we have yeah. uh, the Thanes are one of our highest levels membership tiers. If you're unsure, and what we do is we do Thanes unfiltered in each of these interviews where they get. I've asked them on Saturday or Sunday. Got questions for Josh. There's a bunch in there. Mm. I have no idea what they've asked. I don't look. <laughs> I just read them out to you, right? Cool. Um, and the Thanes. Some of the Thanes watched that video as well and said we really felt for Josh because there was a lot of what looked like a lot of pain in that video. So it's interesting that you say, I don't feel like there's an obligation, because yeah. that video would have told me otherwise. Yeah, so that, I don't, so yeah, <laughs> the obligation on my part is not so much the actual creation of the video, it's the stuff that's associated with why you would watch one of my videos in the first place. Okay. So for me, the obligation part comes from I feel like I've let you down because you are now possibly stepping into a world of hobby that you're unconfident in. Okay. And that if you use me as somebody who gives you confidence to paint your miniatures, I've let you down. Okay. And that's where I felt that obligation. And that, you know, was that the other part of it specifically was that was I had been so excited for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had been hyping it and so there is an obligation from that point of if you are banging on about something constantly and then nothing comes out of it oh i, I get it. It, it it i didn't want anyone to think he's been banging on and on about <laughs> like, like, like he's, he's been going on and on and on about warhammer the old world and now it's here and he's nowhere yeah. to be seen I needed to tell people, like, look, I'm, I am very sorry, and I, you know, I am, I'm still, I am very sorry that it wasn't all done, because I, because I felt like people go, you know what, I can always rely on. I feel like that's an apology that's not needed, though. If I want to, like, if I, if, if I think about the content that you've put out over the course of the last four and a half years and how much you put out, mm. um, it's no secret, right? Games Workshop's preview program supplies a lot of people, a lot of product. You know, ourselves included, we receive a lot of product here as well. Yeah. Um, without Joe, I wouldn't be getting anywhere near as much of it in front of camera on day of order or, or at least the pre-order weeks that are leading up to the, the general release to the public. Um, and I, I used to feel guilty that we weren't getting stuff done. Um, and still to this day, we receive stuff that we don't get done, but we have to prioritize. But then in terms of obligation, I'm also aware of there's, there's been a number of occasions where I probably shouldn't be streaming mm. for whatever reason. Typically, this is around, this is around sickness. I need, to be pretty struck, I need to be struck down pretty bad to, to not 
put content out. And that's because I feel an obligation. So I'm kind of like you. I'm like, I have an obligation. I am your Friday night entertainment. Yeah. I, I sh- I, I, there's no way I should be complaining about the fact that I get to sit in front of a camera for a living and entertain you all and, and play Warhammer for a living. So there isn't an excuse. So yeah. I, I, there was one night, Luce, she swore at me something chronic. I sat in front of a camera for an hour. I normally do 90 minutes. And the reason why I only sat there for an hour was I had a severe case of norovirus. Mm. If you know what norovirus does to a person... There was a reason why I had to stop the stream pretty abruptly. Yeah. And she was like, will you go to bed? Why? I was sat there and I was sweating. And mm. I was uncomfortable. And she's like, don't stream. But I, but I, with, like, with you, I was like, I have an obligation to these people. Yeah. Like, I asked them to financially support the channel. Granted, we don't pay all content permanently. But I asked them to financially support the channel so we can do what we do. We have the studio. Yeah. We have that obligation. Um, and I've had experience with people who have said to me, as long as you're open and you're honest and you say what's going on, it's fine. Yeah. You can not stream and it's fine. I always had that attitude like, no, but it's not fine. It's not okay that I don't do this content. And I just, I watched that video. I really felt for you because I definitely yeah. go through similar processes all the time. Um, I think putting a video out was great, but uh, I genuinely think it was great that you explained to people what was going on. But I think sometimes for us, actually, it's really hard to be like, it's not my fault. Because mm. that also seems like you're going, someone else's problem, yep. right? But actually, I know, so you, took, you put that video out on the Saturday, I know you received the boxes on the Thursday afternoon, yeah, <laughs> yeah, two days before. Yeah, yeah. So there was no chance I was getting 95 co- Tomb Kings. <laughs> well, hang on, but you could paint that whole box in a, in a day. Yeah, no, I could. Demons. <laughs> I could. What I could have done is on the Thursday, when it arrived, is I could have sat down and I could have built for the next 24 hours, primed it, and painted for the next 24 hours, and then I would have had a finished set, and then I would have had to make a video. Yeah. And that video would have been, hello, everybody, it's the War Hipster here. I can't really see. <laughs> um, it's, I've, I've, apparently, I've painted some models. Yeah. And like, yeah, like, I think part of the reason I also wanted to make that video was I was experiencing extremely strong feelings of um, one of the things I struggle with a lot is uh, imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I am the worst content creator at all times, even when the good stuff's happening. And I have to have a secondary voice that's on the other shoulder saying, you're not actually. And sometimes that voice goes away. And so even if it's stuff that's outside of my control, like with the old world box, I was like, I'm known for doing all of it. Yeah. And I can't do all of it. What I could have done instead of doing that video was I could have just paint, built the tomb prints and painted that. I could have done that. Thursday, I could have just built the tomb prints and put a bit painting video out on Saturday and gone, Old World's here, here's how to paint the tomb prints. That would have been dishonest. Okay. With everybody. Because everyone would be like, well, hold on, hold on. Normally you do a sprue review. Then you go, did we paint all of it? And then I go, invariably not. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I did 70% of it and the rest of it's coming, don't worry. There's always that promise that I can make to people. So you normally do a sprue review, then you do your then you do a painting tutorial on what you whatever you deem or whatever you've seen in the comments is the one most people are asking for immediately after. And then there will be painting videos across the next however long Josh has decided it's gonna be the release schedule for of everything else in that box, and I will feel supported by the time that my box gets to me, that I will be able to go, how to paint skeleton warriors, how to paint skeleton archers, how to paint skeleton horsemen, how to paint skeleton chariots, how to paint the necklace bone dragon, how to paint the tomb prints. I'll know it's all there. And I couldn't physically do any of that. But what I could have done is pretended that everything was okay. Mm. And I made the decision to rather than say that everything was a okay or just do something that nobody was nobody the more kind of hardcore supporters of the channel expect not expect a certain thing but are used to a certain thing and they love that certain thing and i love doing that for those people i i love the i love the formats that i have and the 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 schedule that i have if i then just suddenly throw all that out the door they'll all know something's not right yeah so if I don't then go, look, hey guys, everything's not right. I'm sorry. There's a, we as as men have a duty to be 
more open and honest so other men can also be open and I'm honest. I'm 100% behind that. Um, so when I struggle, I tell people. Yeah, good. I think you should. Um, uh, I, I think that honesty and integrity with channels in general is, we do it a lot here, we're very open and honest, about lots of things about our opinions, all mm. kinds of stuff. Um, sometimes people suggest that we're a little too honest about our opinions on things. We've had, I've, I've had run-ins of mini, mini, minimal, but little run-ins with GW where they're like, mm, glad to hear you feel that way in your content. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm open and honest about it. Um, we've done a ton of work around mental health charities and stuff like that historically as well, because I, I think that's very important. I think you're right. I think as, as I hate this word, we use it a load and I despise it, but as influencers, because yeah. that's what we are, whether we like it, whether I like the word or not, whether I like the phrase or not, whether I like the terminology, if you, if you like draw it back to its very rawest for, for, uh, form, specifically with what you do, we influence people's decisions mm -hmm. and we influence people's behavior. So whether it might be that they buy a certain box of models or a certain release that we say is great because we've said it's great or they choose not to because we said it's bad, we've influenced the decision. Whether they choose to go and buy a range of contrast paints because they've watched one of your, tu your tutorials, they've Im you've influenced their decision. Yes. But I actually find typically it does extend a little further than just hobby purchases and hobby decisions as well. We set an example ultimately to people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that video was probably the best one that you could make on that Saturday. But I just found it was very interesting that you said, I don't, I don't feel like I have an obligation. But actually, I think deep down, you probably do. There is. That's what I mean. <laughs> it's a very confusing obligation. It's very difficult to articulate in that I don't feel, I, I feel like the pure mechanics of having a YouTube channel, I could walk away from it today. The pure mechanics of having it. Okay. However, I'm in the videos. The way making the videos makes me feel is in the videos. The, the joy I get out of painting models is in the videos. The desire to make it so that you feel that same way that I feel about it, that's all in the videos. All of that is the ancillary stuff that is behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see or talk about or whatever. That's the bit I do feel almost that there is a duty or obligation, but only because that, to me, it's like, well, I like to think I'm a good person. Mm. And if I'm a good person, then a good person would share this with the world and other people. Um, I think I think if you ask most musicians uh, or artists of any kind of kind of kind of walk of life, they would say one of the reasons you create art is to create a reaction, yeah, or to or to you know just like, you know when people write poetry, it's usually to speak to someone or you write a song and then people engage with it. You it think invokes people, a feeling and it yeah. can inspire as well, which is really important. Exactly. And it, really it's not it's not the it's not the mechanics of singing. It's the way your voice made someone feel. It's not the mechanics of writing lyrics. Anyone can write lyrics, but it's the thing that you feel obligated to your fans to do or the, the thing that you feel like is more important is the way that they draw something out, and that's the bit that gives you the most joy. Mm. I think if you look to, if you point to a number of bands and musicians that you have loved all your life, if you went and looked through all of their um, interviews or whatever, that is the theme that I think would start to come out from their thing is like, you know, and usually that's the reason why those things take off is because people engage with it on that level. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's like the emo movement. I was such an emo kid because so much of it. So much of it just spoke to me, like My Chemical Romance, for example, a great, great example. So much of it just spoke to how I felt at a point in time. And that's why I have such a strong connection with that band, with that album, with that music, with that song. From my perspective with the YouTube channel, painting is where my brain is quiet. And I think a lot of us have very noisy brains. A lot of us have difficulty kind of finding that time to stop. Yep. Um, and it can be a safe space. It can be a haven. It can be a source of social engagement for a lot of people. This wonderful hobby of ours, it was when I was a kid. It was something that you had well, in common with somebody else. We all use that magical word as well, don't we? The escapism. Yeah. You know, escapism. And whether, whether it's on the tabletop, whether it's in the narrative, in the law, whether it's sat there painting quietly and just, just quieting yourself down, sitting there, and I, I, I used to use the hobby when I come in from a stressful job. So my last two positions before I did this for a, for a living were quite stressful jobs. 
And I would often come home and Luce would, she would, would almost instantly be able to tell it's been a bad day, it's been mm. a hard day for whatever reason. Um, and I would often sit there, I'd sit down at my desk and she'd come in with a cup of tea and I'd start hobbying because that was me going, I need to focus on something else. Yeah. So my, the, the job before my last one, um, when I worked for, uh, for Siemens Rail locally, we often used to have to send people out to attend, unfortunately, to attend suicides. Um, on the lines, and they were some of the most. So I, that's when you'd come home, and you're like, I don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about what happened. I just want to sit there. And and actually, what I found often as well was everything would quiet. I'd be, I'd escape in my little world. I'd be focusing on a mold line. You know what? I'm happy that I'm just focusing on that mold line at that moment in time. Yeah. That's, my biggest problem is this is this little bit of plastic here. That's it. But actually, what would also happen is, as well is over time, I found that I would then slowly relax and start talking to Lucy about it, which was actually very important as well, that I was able to do that. Absolutely. But I, don't, I feel like if I didn't have that moment where I could sit down, kind of clear everything away, chill out for a bit, relax a bit, process slightly, I maybe not then would have had such a good experience talking to her afterwards. Yeah. And that's why we, that's why we are ambassadors for Models for Heroes, because they literally use model making and model painting as essentially a form of therapy for people. Yeah. They get them around a table and they give them kits and people will sit there and they just start talking. It's amazing what it does to people. Yeah. I think that's incredible. Absolutely. And like, you think of the power that it has in that, in that instance, whether somebody suffers from the same experiences or, you know, all trauma is different for of all course. different people. It can just be that you work a retail job and it's hard. Yeah. And you use that time to do something that... You might be, in that example, you, you work a retail job and it's hard and you're not particularly proud of the work you do. That moment when you come home and paint, that is something where you can do something that you can be proud of. And I think that's where that kind of engagement with the painting and all that kind of thing can really show. Yeah. So me, as somebody who helps enable people paint, that's what, that to me is like, it's such, because I know what it is for me, painting. And I know, I know what it was for me. I mean, it's different now, obviously, because I make it for YouTube. But what it was for me for a long time was exactly that. Mm -hmm. It was the escapism. It was my corner. It was my thing where I got to express my creativity. Yep. I'm a, mu I'm a musician as well. Don't always get... I never was a successful musician. That was, gonna, that was made painfully obvious to me when, <laughs> from, from when I was about 20 years old. But, like, you know, that was... I was never, never going to go on to become a world-famous record producer, which is what I wanted to be when I grew up. Yeah. I was never going to get there because I don't have the talent. That's perfectly fine. But this is something where I was able to express my creativity on a day, daily basis. It forms such a huge part of me and who I am, and it is a great source of my joy. And as I say, that, that for me is, I feel like that for me is super critical, used to be super critical time okay. when I was going through a harder part in my life before, you know, just you know, work up whenever I wanted and make silly videos on YouTube. Um, Not silly. I know, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they're actually deeply serious. Um, but, um, you know. Look for the hidden meaning. Before I started living my dream, which is what this is, mm. and that is, I guess, actually, I've just, Saying that myself, if I'm living my dream, then I have an obligation to keep my dream alive. Mm. I guess that's also part of it. That's what I mean. Is I, I think it's, it's very difficult to articulate it in a way that I think somebody who's not as creative or in, has this in common as you and I do, that, would un, that make, makes it make sense. So yeah, that video, there was a lot of pain. Mm. It's very, I think it was very brave to put it up. Thank you. And I, and I always will do that. If, if, if things get too hard, if I'm struggling, if whatever, and because I think it's important that other people who also might be struggling see that somebody else is struggling and that we're all struggling together yeah. and that actually it can be okay. That's the famous phrase, isn't it? It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay, yeah. exactly. And that was part of it as well. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult one to... And I'm more than happy to always talk about it in a way that try and make sense of it. But like, it's like, yeah, there's no obligation. And there's also tons of obligation on a more esoteric, yeah. ethereal plane yeah. <laughs> that, that only makes sense to my heart. Yeah. So uh, I want to pick up on an interesting phrase you just used. Yeah. Um, you said living, living your dream. 
Mm -hmm. Right, okay. I love this and hate this at the same time. So it's very interesting. Right? I have two small children, right? one's six, one's 11. My 11-year-old has not too long ago started talking about what he wants to be when he grows up, as all kids do, right? He wants to be a world-famous music producer. James, my eldest, what he wants to be, as I'm sure so many kids in the world right now are, I want to be a YouTuber, yep. right? So what he, what he typically consumes in terms of visual content more often than not is YouTube. We, we have, Luce and I heavily regulate it. We're very on what he's allowed to watch, what he's not allowed to watch. He only gets access to kids' YouTube, which is already itself you know, quite heavily regulated comparatively. Um, but he wants to watch, a, he wants to be a YouTuber. He watches people like Mr. Beast and stuff. I want to, I want to be a YouTuber. Yeah. So um, what we've done over the course of sort of the last six to 12 months is there's been moments where we've given him more of a behind the scenes of what being a YouTuber for in, our, in my little niche world of, of YouTube is all about. And some of it, he's gone, oh, I, don't, I don't want to do that. No. I don't want to sit and do accounts. I don't want to attend events I don't want to have to go to. I, like, there's lots of things where he's gone, wait, okay, so it's not just make a video for an hour and a half every day and that's it. I went, no, it's not. There's so much more to doing this than, than just I make content. Mm. Um, and I often, I often sit here and think about the fact that, because people say living the dream or I'm, I'm doing my dream job. This absolutely wasn't my dream job. My dream job, I don't know what my dream job is. When I was a child, at least, I wanted to be a pilot. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Or fast jets, originally. That's, what, I wanted, that's what, what my dream job was. So this isn't something that I, that I started doing because it was my dream job. But am I living a dream? Well, I think I am, arguably, because I, I legitimately get to do, to some extent at least, what I want. You know, yeah. I'm pretty free. My days are, are, are my days. And I have a content schedule that I'm, I stick to and I'm quite rigorous with. And I'm like you, I feel like if I missed a stream because I can't be bothered that day, I've not just let myself down, there's let a whole raft of people down, or the people that would have watched it live or the people that would have watched it on demand. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that keep me really quite grounded, despite the fact this does feel a little bit like a dream. And one of those things is another thing that you mentioned, which is imposter syndrome. Yeah. Now, this is 100% without doubt been my biggest struggle throughout the whole of my YouTube career. But you feel it as well. Oh, 100%. But, yeah. So, so I, I, I mean, I know how I feel. I know why I feel this way. And a lot of mine was to do directly with my relationship with my previous business partner um, because I kind of grew in the shadow of someone else. But you haven't done that. So, so Warhips has started as, as you and has always been you. And you started creating with, a, I think it was a mobile phone, yeah, making yeah. your videos at home. And, you've, and your channel's grown. And as we said, re recently hitting 60,000 subscribers, right? Yeah. No help from anybody else. But you still have imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I, but why, Josh? But why? <laughs> I think... I think it's quite historical for me. I, th I think usually... One of my biggest problems is I have a very long memory. Mm. And... Um, the problem is, is that whenever I picture moments in my life where I thought that I knew what I was doing or that I was pretty confident that I was the smartest guy in the room or whatever, somebody or something would happen to tear me down. Yeah. And I hold every single one of those moments with me everywhere I go, all of the time. That crash to reality. Yeah, every yeah. single time. A great example was um, I had been working in a job for three, three and a half, nearly four years. Um, my boss at the time created a new position uh, for a senior and told me, you're earmarked for that. And then when it came to actually the application process, I was told, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to apply for that. And I was like, okay, why is that? Because you actually, you, know, you, you need to have done the job you're currently doing for seven more years. Yeah. So, I was like, so you need 11 years of experience before you're even allowed to take the next step on? That's insane. Because surely talent is more important than, than time served. Than time served, exactly. Yeah. It was because they wanted to hire somebody who had a more impressive CV, but had less talent okay. for that specific job. And they did. And it shattered the team. And I left. 
and so did a bunch of other people. Yeah, I, I mean, I, to some extent, that's also knowing your worth as well, right? Right. And so I thought I knew my worth, and then somebody who I trusted told me that I didn't know my worth. Okay. And I carry, I, to this day, I still carry that, even though, I, even though I've proved them wrong. Yeah. I've proved them wrong several times since then. I still carry that. There is still that. No, you, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up and get back in your corner. Know your place. So when I think, when you have every single one of those, probably from the age of about four or five, you know, just being told, no, you don't know what you're, you don't know what you're talking about. So sit down and shut up or <laughs> get in the corner or know your place. Yeah. It's always made me feel like my place is at the bottom. Okay. So whenever I get somewhere, like, as you say, I shouldn't have imposter syndrome. I'm sat here right now with a YouTube channel that has 60,000 subscribers. That is an unbelievable achievement. And I don't feel worthy of a single one of them. Because as soon as I do, something or someone is going to happen. Someone is going to say something or something is going to happen that proves that I don't deserve a do you, is it, would you Would you consider it crippling or would you consider it motivating at the moment? Or, or does it kind of seesaw between the two? I think it's motivating but for the wrong reasons. Okay. I think it's motivating to try and fix that about me rather than to spur on in the face of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's tough. It is, it is a tough thing. Like, it's hard to have, I think, hope. It's, it, it's a harder choice. It's a choice I'm not strong enough to make yet in my journey to choose hope and belief over pessimism and negativity when it comes to um, views of myself. Do you, think, do you think there'll come a time where you can perhaps move into that space rather than the space you're currently in? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. Um, like, I'll tell you a really tough one happened very recently, Warhammer Fest. Yeah. Really, really tough, difficult. I struggle one. with Warhammer Fest, but you know, you, you share it first. So, Warhammer Fest was Golden Demon. I submitted several works to Golden Demon that were things that I had painted for the channel. Yeah. And I talked, I talked about Golden Demon a lot in the build up to it, and I said, I'm just hoping, I'm hoping for a pin. And I started to believe that I would get a pin, and I didn't. Didn't get a single pin for anything that I put in. So Angron in, Archeon, uh, they, they were in. Didn't get a single pin. And that is one of the hardest moments to me was like, so I'm not good enough. Mm. And, and the reason it hit so hard was because it proved the devil on my shoulder right. Despite all the evidence to the con contrary. Well, this, this is where I was about to go with it. But did it actually prove that devil on the shoulder? That one moment, does that prove that devil right when you take the whole picture into consideration? Well, in that moment, yes. But obviously it's incorrect. Because I'm, I'm clearly a good painter. Clearly. Yes. You, you, you can't, I, can't, I can't have the success I have. And I can't have the engagement that I have. And I can't have the miniatures that I have if I am a bad painter. Agree. But for one night in Manchester, when I was craving the opinion of a golden demon judge to give me a pin, wasn't I, I, I know I'm nowhere near the level to win it. That's never my expectation. I'm very, very open and honest about that because that's not what I paint. That's not the way I paint. But a pin would have been, I was craving a pin, just one, just one pin. Didn't get it. And in that moment, I was like, I didn't get a pin for my work. Therefore, it is not good enough. Therefore, I'm not good enough. I think um, I've often suffered with a, uh, we spoke about this brief, briefly yesterday. We'll talk about it again now. Um, I often suffer with a phobia of failure. Mm. It's something that I, I've had from a very young age. There's reasons we, I could go into, I won't, uh, that have shaped me to, to, to get me to this point. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of things that I've gone, a number of things I haven't done or it's taken me a long time to do because I've worried, well, what if I try it and I can't do it, or, or I fail the thing, or, I, or whatever it might be. You know, one of those things 
in more recent years has been my motorcycle license. Mm. I wanted to do it for a decade plus, and I didn't because I was like, yeah, but what if I fail the test? I then look like a, an idiot. Yeah. Um, I, a thing I'd love to have on a shelf one day is a Golden Demon finest pin. I'm, I uh, can paint to a reasonable standard when I really put my mind to it, although I haven't done it for a very long time. Um, and do I think I'd ever win a trophy? Absolutely not. It's not even remotely close to ever being in my future. Mm. But I won't even contemplate entering. And I, I sat here with James. He said, we were talking off camera. He was like, you should enter. I'll help you. I'll I was like, no. No. Yeah. Because I don't like the concept. Like, I don't want to put myself out there. And this is one of the things I often struggle with with the channel. So we talk about imposter syndrome. One of the things I really struggle about with the channel, I don't want to put myself out there for fear of people going, this is awful. This is shit. This isn't, you're not funny. You're not entertaining. Yeah. Because what that then does is that then, that really ramps up those little gremlins. You go, told you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, I think... Yeah, like you said, we did speak about it yesterday. And I think, you know, you talking about your fear of failure. I think I think I must have a fear of failure, but I feel like it's a I feel like I have confirmation bias. Okay. In a slight different thing. Because like I know I'm gonna fail. So I, I I wanna try something, but I know I'm gonna fail. Yeah. And that's gonna make me feel like crap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that 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 <laughs> that I think is what goes on in my brain. I think it's a. I think it's a bit of a glutton for punishment at times. Yeah. And like, has that shaped my desire to want to enter Golden Demon again? Of course it has. Yeah. I, I I never want to do it again. It's a shame. Should I do it? Absolutely, I should. And will I? Probably. Yeah. I will at some point go. I'm gonna give it a go. I'm ready for that again. I'm ready for that again. <laughs> uh, but. What will happen is I will go into it just going, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get a pin. I'm not gonna get yeah. anything. I, I, and and I think a lot of people will go, what are you talking about? And I think people, again, this is where I'm then gonna completely contradict myself by having a little bit of self confidence about myself. People might be watching this now going, you didn't get a pin. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, no, I didn't get a pin. Not for any single one. You can go and see those videos. You can go and look at those models. Um, you've seen my models today, like. Yeah, right. They're all right, right? <laughs> like, you know, one of them somewhere is possibly worthy of a pin. Yeah. Like, but it's, but it's not. My work, at, at the minute, the truth that I have is that my work is not pin worthy. And then that, that brings up just a lot of, again, it's, it's like I said, it's all of that long memory stuff. It's, yeah, I've, I, it's very interesting how experiences, um, even sometimes not related to content or, or the hobby itself, shape you. You know, mm. I, and, and some of them, some of my experiences are definitely nothing, nothing related to the channel, nothing related to the hobby. I mean, I I, um, I probably YouTubed for about twelve to eighteen months before I started working with Winters, um, and then I I spent three years of everyone ever telling me that the reason why I had any kind of success was because uh, of riding Winters' coattails. Now, Winters was one of those people that was like, it's got nothing to do with me. Your content is your content. Mm. Um, we're just working together. He was very good about that. But, but the, the thing is, sometimes I wish people, like, I, I hate the fact that people out there can hide behind a keyboard and a screen because people can chuck such a throwaway comment out there. And I'm like, really think about the impact your comment might have on anyone, for that matter. Um, because just because you're throwing a, a, a creator doesn't necessarily mean that they have the thickest armor. You know, we all like to show ourselves, or I, I, I'm very guilty for this. Um, we like to show ourselves as being tough and robust, but actually everyone is delicate. Everyone has very delicate moments. And people will put a throwaway comment out there. Some people will even just mean it in, mean it in jest, but it can just scratch away at that little, yeah. that little tiny thin barrier that you've got up uh, and break through. And I had a ton of people that were saying, the only reason why we were successful is because, because of winters. Now, um, Two years ago, just over, we started the, really pushing the channel again and trying to run it properly. Um, and you, like you said, right, any kind, of any kind of break from YouTube murders you and you sort of start again. And we had a big old break, like months yeah, of yeah. a break before yeah. I started. So I literally started from scratch. It didn't matter that my channel was showing as 13,000 subs at the time. I was basically starting from zero and I was going live to, to 20 people. Uh, and we've, we've had that process. And I was saying to you yesterday, I get so frustrated because I, I can't get subscriber growth. Mm. I can't do it. And then although I'm like, actually there's algorithms and there's like YouTube wants you to do shorts and we don't really do pre-recorded, which is typically how people grow an audience. And I've got all this data and information that tells me this is why, and these are the things we can do to fix the problem. Uh, and there is some growth that's happening. And my little mind goes, yeah, but it's, it's because it's you. 
Because yeah. you're, your content's not good enough. Yeah, it's because, yeah, no one likes you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and yeah. I think often people look at people that run channels and they go, oh, you run a YouTube channel and you've got 60,000 or 30,000 subscribers, whatever it be. Like, it must be great. Everyone must think you're great. But actually, in your mind, you're going, everyone thinks I'm an arsehole. <laughs> Even the people who are subscribed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they were only done They were only done because they forced that or they took pity on me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They don't actually watch. Like, yeah, 100%. Like, it, it, the, 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 the problem is the numbers. <laughs> The problem is the numbers. Like you look at the numbers, and like you, you, you've got what? 30, 30, did you say 30, 30, 31, 000, 000, thirty-one thousand. Yeah. Why aren't there thirty-one thousand people watching every time you go live? Well, exactly. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> why is it? Why isn't every video I put out have sixty thousand views in the first twenty-four hours? Exactly. Fucking assholes. <laughs> Well, now hold on. Um, yeah, no, like the numbers are the worst thing, and, and, and like, and I think you and I are both similar in this, in that we obsess over them. We do. Yeah, and we spoke a, about this before, right? We did, and it's a terrible, terrible habit that we, that we should break, <laughs> but we can't because of who we are, and we'll get to it one day. Therapy will be good for us. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, it, it's it, it's it's a really difficult, it's a really difficult thing, and I wouldn't change any of it. No, I, no I, and I wouldn't, well, I would, I'd have more subscribers, but otherwise I wouldn't change any of it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd have more subscribers too. But um, like, yeah, but yeah I, I, I just thought it was really interesting. I think sometimes, I, I just wanted to touch on it, because I heard you talk about imposter syndrome, and I also heard you talk about it being, uh, and, and having an obligation, I also heard, heard you talk about it being a dream job. And often I find it's quite interesting that what we classify, what we call, what we label as a dream job, can sometimes actually be quite the nightmare. Oh, yeah. uh, and there's that really that really stark juxtaposition between both sort of sides of what we do. And I think often people that sit that side of the camera who are watching right now can see the dream part and they often just don't see the nightmare part. And I think I really like what you said, actually, when you, when you did that content around not being able to get the Team King done on time. I, I actually, I've never thought of it this way, but I like the concept that it's a responsibility to the audience to show, hey, I'm not doing okay right now and I'm going to tell you this because I need you guys to also be aware of it's not always roses and sunshine and tweeting birds for us as well. Yeah. Sometimes it can be quite hard. And a lot, I'm sure there'll be people that are also watching this that'll be like, shut up, you get to play Warhammer for a living. Absolutely. But, and, that's, and I also feel that as well at the same time, right? I'm like, actually, it's not okay to not be okay. But actually, it, it's, it's just this weird rollercoaster we live in all the time. Yeah, and that was the reaction of some people to that video. Yeah. What are you talking about? It's just a video. Get over it. Yeah. It's, mm. And it's like, and you're like, that is a perfectly valid. That is a perfectly valid position to hold, and I I agree. Yeah, why am I getting so bent out of shape out of video? As I've explained today, there's a there's a lot more going on around it. Not it's not just about the fact that it's a video. It's all the other stuff as well. Yeah. But that's that's that is such a first world problem to talk yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is. And you know, it, it, like that. That's where I say it is a dream job, because. I think everybody looks at it. If you if you are in the hobby, everybody goes, it'd be nice to do this for a living, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it, yeah, yeah, it is. It's wonderful. Believe me, it's wonderful. But you know, there there are there are hard things that come across that that come with it, and especially when you're, as I'm discovering, more and more neuro spicy than you perhaps initially realized. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and what you're doing is you're hand alongside being, I like I like the phrase neurospice. Alongside being that, you're also essentially just putting yourself out there to, for the world to judge. Oh yeah. Um, and I I find that's been it, that's also something that interestingly something that I love and I adore. I, I've said this a number of times before. Live performing for me now mm. didn't know I loved it. In fact, at school, quite a shy child on the whole. Um, I stopped being shy mostly in, in um, when I joined the army. Funny old thing. They, they sort of shape you to be a bit more arrogant and loud. Um, but at school and college, quite the quiet kid, quite the nerdy, geeky kid. Did, if you'd have told me at the age of 15, you'll enjoy the, the concept that you're performing live to hundreds of people, mm. I'd be like, no, I won't. <laughs> no, 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 not me. Like, we'd, we'd go on holidays as a family to Cornwall in the October half term because it cost £100 for us all to go. And there'd be like fancy dress competitions. I'm like, nope, not doing that. Because I didn't want the idea of standing there looking silly, right? Mm. That, was, that was how I was as a child. And, and essentially what I do now is for at least two days a week in this studio and at least three times a week at home, I go on camera looking silly. <laughs> I'm conscious that I do, but I actually really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so in that regard, there is, a, there is a bit of a dream there. Um, 
but, but what you are doing is you're putting yourself out there for everybody else to judge. And that's like the golden demon scenario, right? That's hard. Yeah. Especially if the amount of times that we'll, I'll, I'll make a video, uh, this is not so much uh, prevalent recently, but in the past at least, and we're starting to make pre-recorded content now, or we do a stream and I'm like, that's a banger, and then it doesn't perform. And you're like, oh, I thought we did really well, and it yeah. didn't perform, you know? Yeah. And then sometimes, what's hilarious is sometimes you'll put something out and you're like, this isn't my best work, but I do need to put a stream out, I do need to put a video out, and it will just explode. You're like, I don't understand. And you can't predict it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for you. Like, do you, when do you feel most vulnerable when making content? Because for me, I always like, I always like to have, like, there's a barrier between me and, you for example mm -hmm. so when i was the thing with the music right when i first kind of stepped into when i first started making music i was playing the trumpet from the age of about eight to 16. but i joined a band as a vocalist and was deeply uncomfortable because all i was was a vocalist and then i picked up the guitar and i became way more comfortable performing on stage because i had a guitar between me and the audience same thing with painting tutorial i have a paintbrush and a model between me and the audience um when it comes to putting my face in videos, I don't like doing it unless there's a product between me and the audience. Um, we're having this conversation right now and I'm fiddling with a cube because it's, this is between me and the audience. Yeah. This, is my, this is what I put there as like, a, I'm being as open and honest as I can possibly be right now. There's no barriers whatsoever, but this to me represents a physical barrier between me and you, them. It also gives you something to focus on. Yeah. Take away the stress of being open on it. Yeah, this is the neuro spicy thing I'm yes. learning about myself. Stimming uh, is what we call it. <laughs> stimming is what we, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm learning a lot about myself <laughs> in, in very recent, like, last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But, Which is positive, by the way, I think. It's really good. Yeah, I was, you know, I don't feel like I did enough personal growth for a little while, and now I feel like I'm about to do a lot more um, than I think I've missed doing that. But, yeah, do, do you... Do you feel that kind of thing? Yeah, my, I feel like I'm most vulnerable, um, ironically, when I do my talking head shows at home. Mm. Because I'm literally skip I mean, some people are aware of this, some people aren't. Um, but when, when you make content, it, what's, what was always the strangest part for me to get over in the very early days was the fact that you're literally staring into this black hole of a lens um, and it, you're not talking to a person. So the, the, I, I've found so far, this is the second time I've done this kind of show, I'm actually finding this really, really easy because I'm talking to you and I'm just pretending the cameras aren't there. And sometimes I'll be in love to the camera to be like, hey, I'm aware you're there, audience. Jimming the camera. But it's the... easier right now because it's not live. So the reason why I'm quite comfortable at the moment is because I know that when I put it on there later mm -hmm. uh, and I start editing, if there's a bit I don't like, guess what I can do? Mm -hmm. I can get rid of it, yeah, right? So where I'm most vulnerable is when I do the Talking Heads live streams. And the reason why it's not the game streams is because I've got that big thing that stands in front of me before the camera, the table. And if everything's going wrong, we just focus on the game. We focus yeah. on the models, we focus on the rules. It's not me and, and the audience. Uh, my favorite streams, like, this is gonna be quite interesting and arguably slightly contradictory, but my favorite streams that I do is my Friday night streams. So we do the 40K show on Wednesdays. We started doing a hobby show on Mondays. The hobby show, I'm hobbying. I have a thing that mm. I'm doing, right? That's the focus. The 40K show, I pick a 40K related topic uh, and that's the focus, for predominantly most of the stream. The Friday shows that we do, we try and be a lot more chilled. I would consider it more generic YouTube content. We all talk about anything, mm. um, any topic. The, the streams can often go in random tangents about all sorts of different things. And if you've watched, you know, uh, that's raw me. On the one side, it's my favorite because it's raw me mm. and raw loose. On the other side, it's my most terrifying because that's the most me. And if people don't like it, Cool. So when I be the most version of myself, that's the one I don't like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I feel like that's my most vulnerable moment as well. Do you feel like on that Friday show, though, that I guess you'd also have to ask Luce her opinion on it, but that she also is a, you can disappear into a conversation with her. Yes, she helps a, massively. Yeah, as like a, as she's the barrier between you and if, the audience. When, when, I, when she's not around, if the audience starts to die for whatever reason, because streaming is really challenging, the, the way I like to stream specifically is really challenging. So my favorite, my favorite way to stream is, is constant audience engagement and audience interaction. So if I don't, uh, if I don't manipulate the wrong word, 
because people will take that offensively. But if I don't manipulate the audience to a point where they are moving frequently and constantly and engaging, um, and, I do, and I do a bad job of doing that, and the audience becomes stale and quiet because I'm like, we've got nothing to talk about. Um, and, and I've definitely done this on content before. You can see it happen where I'm like, how, how do I get this moving? Yeah. I need to change the topic because I've, I've gone down this little rabbit hole. We've, we've literally hit a dead end here. And, I, and the audience are going, Okay. Cool, but they're looking at you to perform. So with Liz, <laughs> yeah. you can, I can literally turn to her and be like, "What's your opinion on such and such?" And she'll inevitably have a different opinion to me. What's very refreshing when it comes to forty k content is sometimes I can frame the question. Although about forty k or about Games Workshop and their business practices, for example, I can frame the question as a generic question mm. and point it to Liz and be like, "Say company A did this, and then this happened. How would you feel as a consumer?" Because we accept it as war gamers, and she'll go. Well, no, I'd be absolutely livid. Like, cool. So it's weird that we accept it because it's a GW thing. But and, I, and that's really like that makes yeah. it really easy then because I can just ask her opinion and, and inevitably a conversation starts and then the audience starts happening. When she's not there, that can be really difficult. Yeah, it can be really really hard. Yeah. But it's also my favourite because I'm like that's where it challenges me the most to yeah. try and perform. Yeah, um, I feel like there's like a there's a kind of. There's a weird nakedness and rawness to it, isn't there? About just no barriers. There's yeah. no shields. You know, you're flying through the galaxy unshielded at that point. And it's like, you know, even an asteroid, a, a tiny little space rock could hit you and it throws the whole thing off the balance. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, I, it's interesting. Yeah, I, it's. it's like I said, the, the weird part about it is it is definitely the most exposed and the most vulnerable that I feel, but it's also probably my favourite type of content. It's interesting, I was talking to the Thanes. Uh, we're literally about to go into Thanes questions. We're talking about the, to the Thanes two weeks ago. We went up there um, to see them because they'd organised a day element and went and spoke to them, and I was talking to a few of them up there, and I was like, be under no illusion, I get anxiety before every single stream I do. I, strict, I stream, stream six times a week, right? <laughs> I stream Monday, Monday through Thursday, 7.30 in the evening. Li Joe and I do 13.30 on a, on a Thursday lunchtime, and I do the after dark at 8.30 on a Friday, slightly later. And before every single stream, I sit there 10 minutes before, or I stand there 10 minutes before, and I, my heart goes a little bit, and I get a bit anxious. Because yeah. I'm like, I need to put on a good show. And yeah. quite often, the Talking Heads shows, I'm very guilty for this. I can get in a headspace where I'm like, I'm just going to cancel it, because I'm, I'm too worked up about it. And then I'll do, I, I will always do the stream anyway. The only time I ever cancel is when I'm quite unwell. I'll do the stream anyway. And afterwards, I'll always, almost always come up and be like, oh, that was a good stream. Yeah. What was I worried about? Yeah. And that's the imposter syndrome that before I go live is going, you're going to fuck this up. Yeah. I, I you'll say something thing. and you'll upset people. You'll get yourself cancelled. You'll tell a joke that's not funny. You, the chat will die. No one will gift any memberships. No one will super chat. Mm. It'll be a dead stream. You've wasted your time. And I'm like, uh, yeah. And I, I, and I have to work really hard not to let that little demon just take over. Yeah, I, I do exactly the same, exactly the same thing. Every time just before I go live, I've, I've actually got into this terrible habit of um, setting up the stream before dinner, going and have dinner, and then leaving it until about 7.28, two minutes before I get, go live, before I go back upstairs. <laughs> because if I, if I sit up there, I'll get in my head. And then I won't do it. See, I, I, I'm slightly different. I'll sit there uh, 10, 15 minutes beforehand, and I'm often late to the stream by two or three minutes. And what chat don't know is I'm still, I've been sat at my desk for 10, 15 minutes. Because what I'll do... Well, now they do. Well, now they do, yeah. Because <laughs> what I'll do is I'll sit there, I'll put the stream on, and I'll run through the launch. And I'll yeah. get the launch working and make sure everything does what it does. Because I've got buttons that launch the stream and unmute the mics and that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll check all that, and then I'll test Nightbot, and then I'll test something else. And, I'll do, and then I'll relaunch OBS and run through the launch again. <laughs> and I do like that. I, just one more time. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm happy now. We're going to go live. Um, sometimes if I'm in a fluster, if, I, if I'm really flustered when we start the stream, it's because I haven't done that process mm. and I haven't settled into it and off we go. But yeah, yeah, interesting. No, I just wait two minutes before. That way I can't feel anxious for too long. Oh, I'm terrible. I don't let it build up. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, and, then, and then I just press it and then I just press go. And if it all, if it all goes wrong, it, which it invariably does, as everybody knows on my stream, it's just like, oh, the mic wasn't turned on. Or oh this wasn't working or that wasn't clicked on or oh that's the it's the worst as well when you like you build yourself up to a stream because I sit there and build myself up like I say yeah. you know like, I'll go in live and I game face on I'm performing now and you do two minutes you look down at the chat they're like no sound no sound no sound like oh yeah, for f yeah. oh I no sometimes sometimes <laughs> that's an absolute blessing yeah because then you're like I meet Mike like well what can go wrong now cool I get a second go at that <laughs> <laughs> that's the, you don't normally get that live. 
<laughs> that, I mean, that is that, one of the things I find so refreshing about doing pre-recorded content, which is you know, the main thing that I do, is that I don't actually have that. I don't, when I hit the upload button, I don't get all anxious about hitting the upload button and I, because I schedule it and then I forget about it. Oh, do you? Yeah. The first time I will remember that I put a video up is when the first comment goes through. Do you not, do you not get anxious when you're painting the model though? No. So let's say you get sent um, Angron, right? Big old kit. Yeah. And you start painting it and you fuck it right up halfway through the record. Yeah. For whatever reason. Does that not worry you or are you just like, no. Just, no, I, well, so this is where, I, it's, again, this is going to be a complete contradiction to everything we talked about in the last hour. Every model I pick up, I 100% back myself. Fair play. I, I do the opposite of painting, which is perhaps partly where I'm going wrong. Yeah. People always ask me, how do you figure out your schemes? Do you do test models? Nope. The test happens live as you see it in the video. So when the, video, when the, when the, when the, when the color scheme is happening, that is the first time it is being done. So Angron is a great example. There's no testing on that model that happens. It's just, I know this is going to work. Boom. Yeah, I, that's impressive. Yeah. There's, there's very, very occasionally I will do something where I'll go, oh, no, wait, hang on, that doesn't quite work. And I'll just wipe it off right there and then, wash the brush, and go, I think, because usually that only happens if I go, I'm not sure if it's this shade or this shade. Yeah, okay. So I'll start the recording, and if it's right, then hooray. If it's not, wipe it off, just pull the other paint out and just go for that one. Okay. And that one is invariably correct. Amazing. Which is, so I think that might induce anxiety in a lot of yeah. people in the, in the audience right there. But like, that, and yeah, well, exactly, <laughs> right? So like, like Usharan, Usharan is a great example. I just like, I know exactly what I'm doing here. Yeah, I'm I just gonna go for it. Bosh, bosh, bosh. I have to try to kind of plan it out in my head beforehand. But. Yeah. It's interesting, it's been a really interesting chat anyway, um, because we only kind of really got to know each other within the, I'd say the last year or so. Since we started on um, video games, to start with, yeah. Since we met um, in Almazra all those. But it's quite interesting. We have a lot of the same struggles, uh, sort of thought processes, etc. So, yeah. But an absolute pleasure. Anyway, before we end this, we have uh, the Thanes Unfiltered section right now, right? So if you guys aren't Thanes but want to be Thanes, we have a big WhatsApp chat for our Thanes, who are one of our highest tiers of members. These people, actually, if we think about everything we just spoke about, are incredible for me. Mm. So I created the Only Thanes WhatsApp chat. And the idea behind it was I'm giving our highest tier members a slightly more personal experience rather than just a pictures Discord server. Of your feet. Yeah, pictures of my feet and, um, and naked Joe's feet and naked backside. Yeah, um, and we do that. Like, but, but moreover, like the whole point of it, genuinely, 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 genuinely the whole point of it was, for the, was for them to have a more personal experience. Yeah, one on one with me originally, but we've also got Joe, Eddie, and um, and uh, Kyle in there as well. I gave all the team the option if they want to or not. Um, and those three have jumped in as well. So they get kind of a more, a more personal experience with the, with the team members. Actually, selfishly, what I found is that group's great for me mm. because they are some of my most engaged or the channel's most engaged supporters. Um, and so if I'm having a bad time, I can go in there and start talking to the Thanes. And I'm open and honest, much like, like you've been. Um, and they're very, very good at, at applying reason, applying logic, looking at it from a different angle, calming me down, or actually saying, you're doing all right. Don't worry about it, you're doing all right. They're amazing. So one of the things I wanted to do to give back to them is when we had special guests in, I opened up a whole separate thread in the WhatsApp community that we've got, which is guest questions, and they can ask anything they want. And I, have, I don't read it. Every time the message comes in, I just, I just close it down. And then the first time I look at it is right now. Cool. And we've got some, right? So for example, Mr. Otero got asked if he accepted sexual favors for commissions. That's one of the questions you asked. Okay. Just so you know. Interesting. So I'll say, I'll say thank you to the pe pe person. There is a fair few in here. We've got to get through, okay. um, and we've already been going for nearly two hours. So we'll we'll <laughs> we'll be here for a while. We'll be fine. It's okay. Don't can worry I about use, it. Can I use the loo? No. Okay. Yeah, of course you can. We'll we'll pause for a moment. We'll let Mr. Josh go for the bathroom first. He's he's got to think about his answers now. You think? Yeah, yeah. I got to yeah. compose myself. Yeah. Do you feel much better now? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even hear it flush. Uh, like I was saying, anyway, we have the Thanes, right? They've been amazing for me. We open up the questions for them for all the guests. They get to ask whatever they want. There's a fair few here. Some of these uh, we can basically refer, I reckon we'll be able to refer them to some of the, um, some of the content because I've just seen a couple of the first ones. But we'll go through them anyway. Yeah, uh, we spend me. as long or as little as you want on each question. Uh, I'll say thank you to the person. Most of them have asked one or two questions. So. Let's go for it. Amazing. Right, Sean, thank you so much. He says, if Games Workshop offers you a single production of any out of production miniature from their entire back catalogue for you to paint, which model would it be and why? Uh... <laughs> Weirdly, uh, they're already about to bring it back for a made to order. Okay. Um, well, there's two. The one, 
one of the heroes of Helm's Deep. Oh, yes. You remember the, the Thed and like this? Yeah. And Eowyn like this? And Stry, Aragorn like that? All of that. Love that set. That yeah. was in one of my first ever big army boxes. You know, the, uh, Lord of the Rings was where I kind of really kick-started my games workshop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, love, because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fanboy. Um, so that... And they've already announced that that's going to be on a made to order. So I'm just like, just biding my time. I'm buying for that. that. Yeah. I've got, there's a, the, they released a limited edition one where they've got the hobbits hid under the branch with the, I've got, I've got that well. one next yeah. door. I've just, got it as just well. Just because Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so essentially anything Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Is usually, a usually, a, usually a good safe bet. The metal ones. The other one, which I missed out on was uh, Archeon on his horse. Oh, really? Yeah. I was annoyed I didn't buy it. I should have bought it, but I didn't. Oh, actually, I've got more. There's more. There's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's always tons. Um, if you have Archeon on horse, free, PO Box 431, Southampton, SO40, I can't remember, 0HT, I think it is. All right, and then we'll get it to Mr. The Warhipster. Oh, that would be amazing. But <laughs> Thank you. But um, do you remember the old uh, Imperial Guard Stormtroopers? Yes. With the berets. Yeah. And all that. Them. I'd like um, Legion of the Damned. Yeah. I'd yeah. like the Legion of the Damned. Yeah, I, I, would like Le- I would like Legion of the Damned, but I don't want classic Legion of the Damned. I want them to bring Legion of the Damned back, but do it with everything they know how to make me- models now. I think of like, like you know, we were talking about it yesterday with the Light of Eltharion. Yeah. With all the gaps in the Oh my armor. God. Now imagine you have that Space Marines, gorgeous. but fire is in places, yeah. like certain joints and things. That would be incredible. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Thanks, John. You're a legend. Uh, Rambo, what, uh, he's gone for the typical painter question, I'm afraid, or one of the typical uh, painter fine. questions. Worst stroke, most difficult model to paint and why? Worst stroke, most difficult paint model to paint and why? Um, I wouldn't say it's the worst. It just took me a long time was King Brod. Oh, really? Yeah. Because... With, the Sons of Bayamat guy. The big, yeah. I yeah. Know. So with the, with the Mega Gargants, they are ton of fun to paint but it is a lot of open skin and that's absolutely fine you can get that done pretty pretty easily or you can go like i did and just put loads and loads of kind of different efforts and shades and kind of blends and stuff into it that's not the real big issue with them the big issue with them is there are so many details on them yeah, yeah. That you don't expect for something of that size so when you think of like i think there's a kind of established thing with like imperial knights for example you don't go and sit and painstakingly paint every pipe and cog and rivet. Most people go for a dark colour and then dry brush it because that's the quickest thing to do on the, on the exoskeleton of it. Mm-hmm. And, and, it look, and it's really effective. But when you have like King Broad where, you know, there's, there's a little gremlin sat here and then there's all the things that he's got attached Arrows to. Arrows stuck belt, out of his leg. And, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you've got all the different stuff that's going on on the, on the, on the hammer. It's not that it was difficult per se or it was a little bit tricky it was that it just took so long and it felt like it was taking forever yeah um i probably make things a little bit harder on myself because i barely ever sub assemble miniatures oh i love you <laughs> i i can't like i <sighs> joe sub assemblies with shields and stuff like that i've sub i sub assembly heads right so, like, if I'm painting bare heads on, on Marine, so, like, my, my berserkers that I'm cover- I've been building recently, they're all blue tacked in place. Mm. The reason being is I know for a fact that I can drill a little hole in the bottom of the neck, stick it on a paper clip, and I can paint it, and that's fine, right? Yeah. And I also know that I can safely scrape a little bit of paint off the neck joint, a little bit of paint off the head, and glue it in, and it'll be okay, right? But the amount of other things I've subassembled that I've subsequently fucked somehow because I've got my big fat hands on it, or yeah. um, I've got glue in it, and I'm like, I can't. Yeah. I can't. I can't do it. No, it's. <laughs> I don't like some of them. No, I, I, I never do it, and that makes people very upset on the internet. It, for me, it's like there's always moments. I, I guess actually, a really good armor, a really good thing to point out in, in the response to that question is Space Marine backpacks. Hate them. Can't tell you why. Just hate them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a specific. Okay. I, I don't know what it is. I would. I will happily do fifteen edge highlights. Not that I ever do. I will happily do that to like a leg or a torso or an arm or a shoulder, the gun, the head, backpack, it can get in the bin. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know why. It's just, it's one of those things. I think it's because it's got like, I think it's because it's got like a really subtle 
curved line on the shoulder of it. I hate, I hate backpacks. You've got the dome of it, right? And then you've got the main part. On that main part, you've always got the vents on the back, yeah. you've got the top panel, there you've got is... the whole thing in the square in the middle, and then there's a really subtle line there, and I'm like, I don't want to highlight there's that. A, there's a ton of detail on it for something that is just a backpack. Yep. And I'm like, oh, why have you done that? And then they always, those, the bowl-like areas on the sides, for some reason, they always attach them to the sprue there as well. Yeah. And it's very hard to just really, well, I found, especially for doing yeah. it quickly, to get on a nice the, smooth, oh my God. On the curvature of the, yeah, yeah. Of the jet pack, or the jump pack thing. Yeah. And it extends to every single Space Marine backpack. Every single one. I've always hated it. Jump packs? Nope. So Terminators for Josh, because I don't have any backpacks. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Rambo. Anyway, Luke went, oh, I saw that question, and I'm going to go, what's the most enjoyable model you've painted and why? <laughs> Archaon. Archaon, okay. Archaon. Archaon was a pile of fun because it is a... It's a, it's a to go back to kind of the meat of the podcast. It's one of those that everybody always said, "Oh, you can't you can't do that with contrast paint. Mm. It wouldn't be possible to do mm -hmm. it." And then I went and did it. Mm. And I look at that model. I'm just oh so proud of it. And I did it fully assembled. Amazing. <laughs> fully assembled I love well. that model, by the way. It's, it's and it's the biggest. It's the biggest plastic kit they make. Is it? Yeah. It's all. It's even taller than the Warhound Titan. Is it? Yeah, it's enormous. It's genuine. It's an enormous I didn't model. Know that. It's it's so so big, but like, there's loads of detail all over it. So of course it takes the contrast paint. Of yeah. course it does because there's loads and loads of recesses all over it. But just pulling that one together, for me that felt like that felt like if the, I can do this, I can, I can do, do, anything. do anything. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It felt it felt like the pinnacle of I think the last probably ten years of Warhammering. Yeah. Okay. He also says, thanks, Luke. He also says, which other painters, if any, inspire you? Yeah. So um, quite often, there's people. I mean, there's a lot of people like Richard Gray and all that kind of thing. Most Golden Demon winners and stuff. You look at their art, and it, I, I love anybody who attempts the. I particularly love Golden Demon diorama painters. They just capture that essence of what Warhammer is about for me so yeah. often. Um, and then you have like YouTubers and stuff like Fat Hidalgo, quite a big in in the contrast painting space. Uh, Pete the War Gamer, I loved his content when I was sort of relearning the hobby. Um, Peyton Coach as well, he's fantastic. Duncan, naturally, Peachy as well. Um, yeah, there's lo there's loads of people. I, I I learn a lot of different stuff from a lot of different people. They might not necessarily do anything to do with contrast paint, but they might do something pretty cool with a base or a layer that I might try and emulate. I often find that you can have 10 different people who, who you watch who paint um, the hobby and you can take something different from each of them. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes I feel like that's a, a better way of, of perhaps you know, developing your own kind of style, your mm. own skill base and going, uh, I can do what he does with that base paint and I can do what he does with that layer paint, but I can't do what he does with that layer paint and, and you know, vice versa. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think having a, a broad spectrum of people that you look at and I, I think that with the hobby in general, it's a very cheesy thing to say in life, but with the hobby, with the hobby in general, You'll never stop learning. You'll, there'll never be. No, you never will. You'll never get to a point where you're like, completed it, mate. You just, you just won't with painting and hobbying and building and sculpting and all that kind of stuff. There's so much you can do. Yeah, I mean, there was. I can't remember who it was now, but there was somebody who used texture paint to create, um, like you know, like the the crackle paint. Mm. Used that to add extra texture details to like actual plastic models. That's amazing. And I was like. I can't remember. I'm so sorry. I can't remember who it was, but I was like, "There's genius." Yeah, There's absolute actual. I remember genius. the very first time I watched people that painted lava colours all over the base and then covered it in texture, like textured paint, and yeah. painted that black, and then like a crust, and then chipped some of it off. And I was like, it was "Genius!" Yeah, well, it's so easy and simple. But I would not have thought that. Yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah. Amazing. All right, Kev. Thanks so much. She says, "What made you decide to mostly use Games Workshop contrast paints as opposed to other brands?" Um, cause I have used Games Workshop stuff all my life and in my opinion, I know many of you will disagree, they make the best stuff for me. I think, I think in terms of a generic label, 
their paints for me are better than, than most of those brands. Yeah. There are, I've, I have started to experiment. I have started to find some other brands that I really, really like. So Vallejo Metallic range is beautiful. It's really, really nice. Yeah, I've Scale 75 that. do also do some very nice metallics. Um, there's nothing wrong with the GW metallics, to be clear. No. Um, the ones that they have, the Retribute Armour, the Balthazar Gold, I can't remember the name of the, the, the gunmetal silver now. Lead Belcher. Yes, thank you. Are beautiful paints that I've always used in a trusty. Uh, and I, I actually don't think I ever... This is the thing, right? Could I paint models using just Citadel colours and nothing else? Yeah, 100% I could, and I'd be quite happy and comfortable with what I'm doing. Because I know the paints, I know how they work, I've used them loads. Could I, could I say that about any other individual brand at the moment? No. Now, there's some people are trying it. Like, obviously, Duncan has got his, his two thin coats range, and yeah. he's got conversion charts which show you what they are. Um, Army Paints have got some quite, um, quite extensive ranges and stuff now. So could I, could, is it possible to paint a model fully with one of those paint sets only? Yeah, of course it is. Absolutely. Could I do it? No, because I know Citadel. Yeah. It's that experience we talked about earlier. I was the same. I bought my paints from Games Workshop because it was next to the models. Like, yeah. that's the model that I want. Here's the colours. They're the colours. Mm. And that's exactly how my, how my range started. And once I started using, once I started, when I bought Mephist and Red as a base, I was like, what's the layer? Well, the layer that the Games Workshop app tells me is, is Evil Sun and Scarlet. When I go into Games Workshop, there's Evil Sun and Scarlet. There we go, I've got my pot. Yeah. And that's how my collection started to grow, right? Yeah. So, um, Game, Games Workshop paints are the most supported by its own company. You don't, because, you know, Vallejo can't make Vallejo tutorials how to paint Space Marines using Vallejo paint. I mean, they can, but they can't, well, they can't market their paints using their, uh, somebody yeah. else's models. Often what you'll see is like, for example, like the Army Painter, all of their stuff, they have their own printed models or whatever, all the D&D models, for example. I think, I think the main thing for me is like, is, is I, I'm just, I'm always confident in what a Games Workshop product is going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I'm also confident in going into a Games Workshop shop. I also think that it makes your content more accessible. There is that as well. Um, and... and not just that it's more accessible than everybody has, ha, ha, probably has Citadel paints. Everybody can get them. Not everybody well, can get every, every other paint. Yeah, 100%. But also, and to the first point, the amount of times I've watched a video that you've put up and you've said, well, you're just going to take a, a colour, whatever, I don't care, a Baharoth blue, yeah. and I'll, go, I'll turn around to my paint racks and I'll be like, there it is. Yeah. I've got it. I don't have to buy it again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly that. And like I said, yeah, yeah there's, there's that confidence... And, and like, if if you need to get Baharoth blue, you know exactly where to go and get it. Mm -hmm. If I said, if you you need you need uh, shade eighty three of insert paint brand here, and you go, okay, cool. Well, I wonder where I might have that. You might give it a quick Google, and it might be like, yep, yeah, shipped from Albania, and yeah. it'll get there in three to six weeks. Yeah. And so like, there is that there is a barrier to an untried product that you can't test well, in shop, that you can't get hold of, that you have to order, that is then a risk. Here's the other thing that I've 100% done, right? Without any shadow of, of doubt whatsoever. Some of you won't be able to do this because of where you're from and the countries that you live in, but this is definitely something I've done, right? Uh, we have a channel sponsor, we have Element, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I'm buying models, I'll buy from Element because 10 to 15% off when you buy three boxes, which are 100 pounds, is quite a considerable amount of money. But if I have that one paint that I don't need because you've said, you need, Liam, you need Baharoth blue to highlight this blue, what I will do is I'll get in the car and I'll drive for literally 15 minutes and I'll buy Baharoth blue. And, and, there, and, there, <laughs> and there it is. That, yeah, is exactly. Exactly, that is exactly one of the reasons. You can't do that in most... In London, fine. Yeah. But not everywhere, not everywhere has a games workshop, but not everywhere also doesn't have a friendly local gaming store. No. And some of them... I'm not that friendly. Yeah. Like you can go in and you can be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I want this pot of Baharoth blue. Yeah. And that person will do what the old staff in Games Workshop used to do. They get told off for doing now. Instead, of, they'll go, no, you need this one Yeah. from Monument Hobbies. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but that's not the one I want. That's this one. Like, this one's better. Yeah. And it's like, well, it might be better, but the one I want is that one. <laughs> and I've had that interaction a lot in some independent stores. And that was one of the reasons I got turned off going into Games Workshops when I was 16. 
Yeah. They used to always have that man that sat at the back who criticised every choice that you made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I hate that. And if you do live around the corner from Element in Stockport, for example, they have an incredible paint range. You yeah. can go into the shop. But that's really rare. That it's is just very really rare. rare. Yeah, yeah. You know? A lot of like the local ones, like there's 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 a ton of them in Gloucestershire, I think of places like Antics. Yeah, who I think used to be a nationwide brand, but I don't think they are. They're, I I've not heard of them. So. Yeah, they're, but they're they're tiny little hobby shops that also sell, yeah, you know, model railways. <laughs> so yeah, you can get like oil paints and stuff from them. But always a risk. Yeah, uh, I, I the, the biggest thing for me is trust as well. Trust in the brand. I don't know what they're going to do. So yeah, uh, thank you anyway, Kev. Sean then says uh, he puts another he puts another. It is a question. I've just been watching your Crew Rider video. Quite frankly. Yeah. How very dare you? Oh. <laughs> that was it. Sorry. <laughs> How very dare you? All uh, I can do is apologise from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> are, are you saying how very dare you because you've watched it and you think, oh, I can do this now, and then you've bought a Crutox rider from the Crut Hunting No, pack? I assume he's like, oh, he's murdered that model. That's what I reckon. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> I, I am the worst painter on YouTube, as Alan. it's established. <laughs> Alan, thank you. He says, how do you approach choosing colour recipes and how do you avoid having a standard colour for one texture? Um, okay, so I get, this, I get this question, like, how do you choose colours? One of the best things to do, look at the corners. What I mean by that is when you get a, when you get a piece of box art through, look at the corners of the... Don't look at the model. If you look, you've got the black armour, for example. Black armoured Space Marines, very easy one to pick. Look at the corners, look at the edges. That's the colour you need to paint it. Because it might be black armour, and black armour is as black armour does. But there's different types of black armour. You've got that kind of more industrial, you've got that more metallic, you've got that clean, you've got the shiny, you've got the evil, you've got the more malevolent black. If you look at what Games Workshop does, sometimes there'll be purple highlights. That's how you choose purple highlights. You look at it, sometimes it's like, it's like a squeaky clean blue, like Death Watch, a great example. They always go for blue highlights on Death Watch armor. You look at things like Iron Hands, it's things like metallic highlights and this sort of thing. I always look at the, I look at, I look at what the color of the highlights are, that will determine my base paint. Slightly backwards way of doing it, but that's sometimes how you can like identify a red. If it's an orange highlight, they've gone for probably closer to like Blood Angels red. If it's more of a kind of fleshy highlight, like Kislev flesh or something, they've generally gone for something like corn red, and then I convert it into contrast paint. Okay, interesting. Because um, that a lot of it comes from experience. Like you, the more you use a paint, the more you know what color it'll look like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, there's there's elements of that. And then if you want to get really technical, sometimes there is color theory involved. If you're yeah. not quite sure what a how to make a set like okra okra is really weird if you look up how it's made i can't remember off the top of my head but there's like blue and green in when, there or whatever. i'll be honest with you when people start talking about color theory it turns me off yeah because, yeah. I, because i'm just a hobby painter i'm not an artist yeah and, so. the, and that and that is that is fair enough but like you some like if you look at like death guard it's green but there's yellow in there yeah, yeah. you can you can you can see it so at that point it's like well how yellow is the yellow you can then, and then I just eyeball it. So it's not like, I'm not going to mix like Dark Angels Green and Imperial Fist because that's not going to make it look that kind of sickly green. It's closer to Nasdreg Yellow, for example. So if we look at the second part of this question, do you have standard colours for single textures? Because I've seen this happen a lot in Games Workshop videos and I'm definitely guilty of this. So like this bit's going to be a brass colour. So I know that I'm going to apply Balthazar Gold and then I'm going to use Agrax Earth Shade. And then I know I'm going to do that for my brass colour. Yeah. And if I come across brass on a completely different model range that I'm painting, Guess what? I'm going to use Bounce or Gold. Do you do that, or do you, or do you typically try and do something unique and bespoke for each model range? Or yeah, no, there are there, so there are some things that do end up being as like kind of generic recipes because I think they are the most efficient. Mm -hmm. So like my Hammers of Sigmar Gold is the same as my Custodes Gold. Um, Retributor armor shaded with either pure fire, fire slayer flesh or a one to one mix, depending on how strong you want that to be. Relayed with Retributor armor. And then highlighted with a roughly two part Stormhost Silver to one part Retribute Rama mix. Some people say, why not Liberator Gold? Because my mix is a lot shinier, which then means all the gold just pops mm, okay. rather than Liberator Gold. There are some things, like my Blood Angels red armor. Sometimes if I see something that's close enough, I'll just be like, yep, Baal red, and then a one to one mix of Blood Angels red and Lamia medium that's going over the top of it. Um, a lot of my metallics are, like you said, like if, you, if it's a brass, I'm like, yeah, if it's a silver, I'm generally going to do Iron Warriors, 
So you actually do have standard recipes? There are some, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sometimes you'll look at something there and it'll be like, it's like, yeah, it won't, it's not efficient, it's not, it's not appropriate there. So like, Space Marine bolt gun silver details is not applicable to Zinch jewellery. Yeah. Because uh, okay. you, you just look at the pictures and the Zinch jewellery will have like all kind of like hints of purple and blue in there. It's like, yeah, so a really dark gun metal isn't going to really fit there. No, it doesn't fit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. I, this, I, I'm always conscious of it because I, I'm someone who definitely has specific recipes for a brown or a, or a red or whatever. Because um, I know it. it, much like the Games Workshop paint conversation we just had, I know it works. Mm. So I'm like, as long as I don't see it being completely contrasting on this model in a negative way, because it doesn't fit because of perhaps the warmth of the model or the or coldness or whatever, I'm like, well, I'm just, I know it works, I'm just going to use it. Yeah, yeah. I think some people go, well, that's bad. Well, it's not bad because actually when you're applying it to a different model with different scales, different textures and uh, different perhaps base colours, it's the same, you know it's the same colour, but it will look different because yeah. what it's surrounded by yeah, like so, you wouldn't want to be a collector of. If you were a collector of Blood Angels and Red Corsairs, you wouldn't want them to be the identical. No, red. of course, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's where there is then change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I generally try to. There, are, like I said, there are some recipes that I fall back on because I just think they're great. Cool, Gaz. He says, with contrast paints wearing off easier, what's your method of protecting your paint finishes from frequent handling? Uh, <laughs> this is going to make some people uncomfortable. I never varnish my models. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, because I have not experienced that paint, contrast paint rubs off as much as other people have. Everything I touch rubs off. Yes, it's probably because you've got slightly oilier hands. Than I've got I acidic do. hands, yeah. Yeah, I've got really dry hands. Yeah. So the paint doesn't rub for me. My paint always rubs off. So yeah. I, I'm at a point now where I'm base coating in black, and then varnishing. Yeah. Because it, it will just rub to plastic every time. Yeah, so that I don't, I don't experience. Oh, sorry, guys, can I help you there? Sorry, yeah, no. I mean, look, there, I mean, there are there are a ton of really good varnishes, uh, and there are a ton of not so good ones. I think Windsor and Newton maybe do a really good one. I just use Vallejo polyurethane satin through an airbrush. Yeah, the Vallejo ones I've heard is very, very good. Um, and actually, one of the one of the GW ones, I think Storm Shield, that one's quite good as well. You can get that one in a can. Well, so I don't know. The old one that they had in the can, I don't trust Purity it. Purity seal, it was awful. Because <coughs> it snowed so many of my models, yeah, I don't pure, trust yeah. it. Purity seal was terrible. But the newer one, it might be Munitorum varnish, I think. Possibly. Actually, it's actually quite good. Oh, um, maybe I'll try it. I should do it, but I generally don't. Mm -hmm. uh, he then says, what key, so maybe we can help with it. What key colours do you still feel, uh, sorry, what key colours do you feel are still missing from the GW Contrast Paint lineup? That is a really good question. Um, I think... Their flesh colours need more variation. Um, so there's like, there's the, there's the three I point to are Gilliman flesh, Fire Slayer flesh, and Dark Oath flesh. And Gilliman is kind of goat, right? Everyone I ever talk to who uses Gilliman is like, yeah. that's the one to use. Yeah, Gilliman is excellent flesh for skin, for white skin, if you're going to paint it. It's also a very, very good shade paint. It's really good over gold. Um, because it does what Reichland Flesh Shade does, just stronger. Um, so it's very, very, it's very, very versatile. Fire Slayer Flesh, I would say, is almost as good, just a little bit stronger. So it has that tendency to be a little bit more splotchy if you're not fully controlled with it, which is why some people don't like it as much. Uh, and then Dark Oath Flesh, I think, to my eye at least, has a little bit too much orange in it, which to me means that the paint is kind of labelled a bit wrong, because mm -hmm. it's not... If I said to you dark oath flesh, you'd expect something much darker, like kind of a more mid-tone, but it's still kind of, they're all kind of sit around about the same thing. So I think what they need is they need like a really kind of like pinky, almost, I would call it hobbit flesh. You think of like rosy cheeks and it's like, you think like the really pinky skin that they sometimes paint into their things, they're missing that type of thing. They're also missing, I think, just an appropriately named paint for painting black skin and stuff like that. And also an appropriately named one for painting like brown skin and this, that, and the other. So just various more skin tones, I think, is definitely what needs to be done. Uh, and then I think yellows, they're fine. Purples, they're probably fine. Greys, there needs to be one that actually emulates what Mechanica standard grey is. Because at the moment you have Space Wolf grey, which is basically rust grey. Yeah. You have Basilicanum grey, which is a really browny grey. 
kind of kept closer to Skaven Blight Dinge. And then you have Storm Vermin Fur, which is not Storm Vermin Fur, that's a layer paint. Uh, Rattling Grime, which is quite quite a brown. It's 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 you know, it's like it's like really thick agrax in some ways. Um it's quite heavy. They don't have a sort of clean what I would call just like a mid grey, like your kind of like your trainers. They don't have a paint that makes that colour. Or at least not in a strong way. Almost sprue colour. Or yeah, sprue colour, like Dawnstone, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um grey grey they are definitely missing. And I think like like a really deep red. Flesh Terrors is great. Blood Angels Red is great. Sigvald Burgundy is close. There's still quite a bit of pink in there. So just a, a really like Galvor back red. Word yeah, it's interesting. Red. Um, I, I, I'm very interested actually in the flesh thing because I was, I was sat there just thinking briefly to myself I think in all of their paint ranges ever all of their flesh colours have always been white flesh quite interesting yeah they, they did change that so you have Night Quest of Flesh Blood Reaver Flesh Catachan Flesh and they are um, much darker tones which is okay. which, and, they're, and they're, they're absolutely beautiful paints they're, they're really really nice um, and as you say yeah no, they do have Catachan uh, mm. sorry uh, Cadian um, Kislev, Bug, was Kislev, one, yeah. Blade One, Bugman's, Ungor. Um, yeah, there's okay. a lot of them. Cool, I like it. I'm a fan. Uh, Dave, thanks. He says, "Are you Joe's older or younger twin brother clone?" Yes, to all of those. Yeah, all the things. I can be whatever you want me to be. <laughs> thanks, Dave. Carl, be whatever Joe wants. Carl me to be. says, "What contrast, if any, should would do you avoid? Do you avoid? Is there any that you actually do avoid?" Uh, so of there's ones that i barely use ethermatic blue is one because it doesn't really do what i think it should do uh pilar glacier no yeah pilar glacier i don't really use because it's too pale it doesn't, it doesn't change the it doesn't change the color of the thing as much as you want it to it's actually better to take a darker one and thin it down you've got better coverage there are ones that i don't it's not that I don't like to use them, but it's ones that are more tricky to use that I think need to be reformulated. Uh, those would be Shaiish Purple, Dark Angels Green, and Leviathan Blue. Interesting, because you use quite a lot of Shaiish Purple, don't you? I do, yeah. I, I, I'm changing closer to uh, Leviathan Purple, because it's got... It's, it's, Leviathan Purple is beautiful when it comes out of the pot. Shaiish Purple has got... It's so, it's so cold as a purple. Um, and what they didn't have for ages was an actual warm kind of, I would call it like grape, like, you yeah, know, just yeah. like, like, or like a black currant or something like that. They didn't have a really nice warm Ribena color. That's what I'm kind of looking for. Uh, Leviathan purple is that now. Okay. So like when you have like really kind of luscious, thick purple cloaks and stuff, Leviathan purple all day, every day. But before it would be a case of, you have to use Shaiish and then you have to throw in a tone of red or okay. like pink or something. So quite often you'd see me use shyish purple and then cover it over with volupus pink to get a kind of pinky purple. But nowadays you could just use Leviathan. You could just use Leviathan. And I think Luxion purple is also really nice as well. I don't have, there's not as many of applications for it, but when it does come up, it's like, oh yeah, this is a really fun thing. <laughs> it's a banger. This is, a, yeah, this is gorgeous. Okay, paint. there you go, Dave. Uh, Carl, sorry, I hope that helps. Uh, Adrian, thank you. He says, how did you start in the hobby and how did it evolve to where you are now? He then says, also, what's your lowest moment during a journey and how did you overcome it? So how did you start the hobby? I started the hobby when I was six years old because my mother handed me a white dwarf magazine that had a free Necron in it. Amazing. How did it evolve to where you are now? Well, we've kind of covered that. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, brief, the brief cliff notes are, I did that, did a bit of Warhammer 40k, stopped. Lord of the Rings came out. Lord of the Rings Warhammer came out. That was me for the next six, seven, eight years. Yeah. Went to university, stopped, got my second year's worth of student loans, I was right back in it. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, it turns out if you buy a box of Eldar, they'll keep you occupied for much longer than getting shit-faced on a Saturday night. And they cost about the same. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I did all of that. And then uh, stopped for a bit after uni, moved to London, was there for a couple of years, and then went through a breakup and decided I was gonna go, I was gonna go to Guitar Guitar in Epsom to buy a guitar. And then I was like, it's a bit rich for my blood at the time. I just bought one about six months previously. I was like, this is a, this is a, this is a stupid pity purchase. I'm just going to leave. Walked around the corner and there it was, Games Workshop. And I was like, do you know what? Screw it. 
went in and I bought, um, it was at the time, it was three tactical marines and a set of paints. Yeah, yeah. That, that one you talked about earlier, the, yeah. the tactical marines one. Uh, bought that and then, yeah, I have painted every single day since then. That was like 2016. Oh, really? 2016, 17, something like that. Amazing. Um, so did you, have you got a lowest moment? Lowest moments. Because um, the question is, have you got, what's your lowest moment and how did you overcome it? I think, I think, I think, I think lowest moment, we probably, we probably already talked about it. I think lowest moment was probably that golden demon moment. Okay. It was walking around, it was walking around it when there was barely anyone else there and they'd put out all the stickers so I could see everybody else that had got a, got a sticker and, yeah. then, and every single one of my models no sticker. And like previously to that, I'd had a lot of people gassing me up being like, yeah, yeah, you'll definitely get a pin. You'll definitely will. You definitely will. And I, in that moment, I was like, I am unworthy of every single accolade I've ever had to this point. Um, I got over it because I have an incredibly supportive partner. I have incredibly supportive friends who basically browbeat me on the walk back to the hotel <laughs> saying, cheer up, you fucking loser. Because, <laughs> because this is not an indication. At one point, one of them said, they're probably just annoyed that you're able to achieve the box art much simpler than they do. I mean... And I was like, stop gassing me up. <laughs> That's want, what got me here. <laughs> I want to go to bed and be sad. Why would you make me feel better about myself at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, look, honestly, just I, had, I have an incredibly... I'm very lucky to have an in, incredibly supportive group of people around me. Adam, Rich, if you're watching. Alice, she won't be watching. Um, Sorry, she just doesn't engage with any Warhammer content at all. Alice, I mean, she might now. If I tell her that I've, if I tell her that I've mentioned her and that she doesn't support <laughs> Warhammer content, she might now watch it. I'm going to trim that, that I just did there. I right, just put that as a reel. Just show her that. <laughs> but there you go. I'm going to get in trouble now. <laughs> um, no, I, like I said, I just, I, I have, I have an incredibly supportive group, and then everybody in my Discord as well. I was just like... I mean, I think, I think in seriousness, it's a fundamentally important rule for life. Mm. Um, surround yourself by the right people. You know, in anything you do, surround yourself by the right people. people I, I've often met people who have had trials and tribulations and what's made it inherently worse is they surround themselves by the worst people or by bad people. Um, and people can be bad for you for a multitude of different reasons. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily an evil person. But they might be bad for you it, it, for, for reasons. So, you know, I often suggest to people, find your tribe, surround yourself by, by good people. Yeah. Don't necessarily surround yourself by yes men or people that are just going to agree with you the whole time. But surround yourself by good people and that will almost always help you in any kind of shitty or difficult situation. Yeah. It's definitely absolutely. been my experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I would echo every single one of that. Yeah, I'm just, that's how, I, that's how it got me through. Yeah. And then I just dive straight back in. I was just like, I can't, I can't let that hang over me. No, it's good. Rest of, rest, rest of the Band-Aid rips right off, get back into it. Yeah, I, I went home. I think I was painting the very next day. I was getting the next Seraphon videos ready or something like that. Cool. Love it. Dave, so thank you, Adrian. Dave says, if you wanted to teach a 12-year-old to paint, what models would you recommend and what colour palette would you use? That's a, di that's a difficult one. I think, I think I'm pretty sure Dave has got a 12-year-old at home, which is probably why he's asking. <laughs> yeah. I think I think I think the best way to I think any any firstly any model can be can be cool. You just have to explain what it is. So I've done this with I've done this. I've, I've I used to work at Games Workshop. So I used to run um, I used to run uh, Intro One Hundred One. Was what they called it, um, where you would do a build, paint, and play with the starter models. So at the time it would have been um, firstly it would have been Dark Vengeance. So Chaos Oof. Space Marines and Dark Angels, yeah. uh, and also Stormcast and Corn uh, Bloodbound. Uh, Corn Bloodbound. Um, then I was still at Games Workshop when Dark Imperium came out, and that was Intercessors, Death Guard, uh, and then I'd, I'd left just before Soul Wars came out. So I never, I never had to try and do. If you want to paint a ghost? It's really easy, I promise. Um, so I think, I think, part, firstly, any model can be appropriate, but the reason. The reason the starter models are the starter models is because they are the easiest to learn because they're very forgiving. So like Stormcast, Space Marines, wide open panels, easy to go. Um, I think 
ultimately the best thing to do with a 12 year old is probably to just show them a bunch of pictures and let them understand that um that they could do any color yeah and they'll invariably just pick whatever we took my eldest into the store yeah um loose took him specifically because the gw staff know me um and i didn't want there to be any buzz. and i also know i'm predominantly if not currently fully 40k I was like, I don't want, I said to Lisa, because he was showing interest, I said, I don't want there to be any buyer. Mm. I don't want him to go, I need to do one before k because dad does one before k yeah. He took him in the store and just was like, look around. If there's anything that piques your interest, let's go and have a look at that thing. If nothing piques your interest, that's also fine. So she did that, he had a look around, and he picked a box of um, corn blood bound off of the shelf. Mm. Absolutely not what I would have picked for him, to be honest with you. No. And then um, eventually what we did is we bought him the battle tome as well. So he built his corn blood bound, he's really happy, he bought the battle tome. Um, and that was a great way of going, here's a load of pictures. Which ones do you like? Yeah. Like, you can do anything. If you don't like any of them, which is your favourite colour? You know, things like that. Um, and he did, he did paint one. He painted a corn demon as well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think... I, I mean, you're right with what you say about Stormcast and, and Space Marines. But ultimately, if any, any person, whether they're 12 or, or 20, if they look at Space Marines and they're like, I don't like Space Marines, don't make them paint Space Marines. No, exactly. Now, obviously, there's, there's things to avoid. Like, don't get them an Imperial Knight. It's a waste of a hundred quid. Maybe, like, because you don't even know if they like. They don't even know if they. Yeah, like possibly. It at that point. There's also a possibility they go. I actually really love giant stompy robots, and well, that's them hooked. Well, well yeah, I mean, it's like, less likely, a, but there's a possibility. Yeah, if you've got an imperial knight lying around at home, then yeah, by all <laughs> means, like, like you go for it. But like, you know, it's that, it's that, it's the risk of any kind of new hobby purchase when you're that age. When I was that age, I wanted all the big stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't course. have done anything with it. I'd have just, I'd have just, I'd have just had it. But like for me, it was like I really, truly fell in love with it as soon as I saw uh, the Fellowship of the Ring uh, starter set, and then consequently the Two Towers one. I was like, oh my god, these are just the best yeah. things ever. Um, so you never know what's going to catch their interest. In terms of just the pure mechanics of painting, the less fiddly, the best. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, but again, in terms of, so he, he specifically asked about colour palette, and I'm like, again, that's very, the problem is, Dave, I like this is quite subjective. I would always say, pick models that you think is cool, pick colours that you like. Yeah. Metallic ones are quite good, because it gives you that understanding of how to actually kind of work with the majority of paints out there. Like, if you're not going to do contrast paint, which, you know, obviously, people choose not to. And those people are wrong. <laughs> is, that you want, the, is that what you want to say? That's the silent part of that statement. <laughs> oh, no. I said the quiet part loud and the loud part quiet. No, I mean, like, contrast paint, obviously, it's a, it's a slightly different um, that's sort the, of thing. There but. we go. I've just found it. Whilst doing the whole show, I always have to think about what's the title of the video going to be. Yeah. So when we were sat with James, it wasn't until, like, most of the way through when someone said, what's your most challenging army? So we had to do a Bacon Space Marine army. That was the title of the video. Bacon yeah. Space Marines. What I'm going to do is... The title of this video is Some People Don't Use Contrast Paint and They're Wrong. Well, That'll you, be the video. Well, you said that part. I, <laughs> I implied it. No, I mean, like, no, metallics are a really good way to get started because it's the mechanics of painting with about 90% of paints out there. Yeah. It's take a bit, put it on your palette, and thin it down. Yeah, okay. It's a really, it's a really nice colour palette to work with. And it, it, you know, everybody loves a shiny thing, right? Damien has, yeah, they, 100% they do. Yeah. Damien has a big message. He says, how do you see the Warhammer YouTube other platform area evolving? Currently, it's private funded by members in the same way we would fund the local arts and theatre. Mm. Do you think it will evolve into larger groups like mini production companies and collaborations with profit share or stay the same model and thus some channels will just ebb and flow in popularity? I'm trying to make it semi-open-ended so he can elaborate. I mean, I don't understand the message. I kind of get it. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you do. No, no, I do. Uh, so, like, yeah, he, I think, I think there's definitely space for it. I think, I think he's talking there about something that you've talked to me about in the past of kind of what does the Netflix of wargaming look like? Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think it's definitely possible. Um, I think, I think that would be a real positive thing i mean this is the thing with youtube content creation is that youtube content creation can be an absolute minefield in terms of uh when it because it, it's it's a creative endeavor that involves money yeah right and so i could be making x amount of money you could be making y amount of money 
and third partner could be making Z amount of money. And we might want to pool all of that together to make something truly incredible in terms of a business like a production house where we go, you're going to make two for this, you're going to make two for that, and you're going to make two, two for this. And we're going to do that on a weekly basis. And it's a one-stop shop for people to subscribe to or because um, we're never going to get onto broadcast television because mm -hmm. that was a terrible idea for a TV channel. Um, but like, it's like Netflix or Amazon Prime or Crunchyroll or whatever. They are the model to go for, HBO Max, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that a possibility in the future? 100% it is. It's difficult when you bring together a bunch of islands. Yeah. So you're trying to unite island nations into a single force that will have varying degrees of success, engagement, and this, that, and the other. Is it good for, like, so, for example, like, if you and I were to, 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 do, to start this endeavor and we found somebody who makes law videos, that, that's the full gamut, right? To a point, yeah. Yeah. So you've got, you got your battling. Well, you need somebody who makes, a video, who makes videos about novels, which is technically law videos, and you need somebody who makes a video, videos about collecting. That's the other part of the hobby that everyone, <laughs> everyone but, but here's the thing, right? This is a difficulty. So it's something that I've wanted to do for ages. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a path I've wanted to tread for ages. It's a path I tried to tread a little bit when DZ was in existence. Um, and for various reasons, it didn't, it didn't continue. But I thought it saw some success. But for example, let's say I, I wanted to push this kind of idea again. And I came to you and I said, hey, Josh, I've got this idea. And I want to do this sort of Netflix model. Um, at, at which point, what you're going to do then is agree to essentially come under my umbrella. Yep. Now, I know full well that if someone came to me and said, Liam, I want you to come under my umbrella, so you don't necessarily have full control, I'm going to say, no, because I'm my own boss and I look after my own team and I look after my own studio. I think that's the other problem, isn't it? Same as your, your, your multitude of islands that you're putting together, all their own nation, or each of their own nations has their own leaders yep. who's in charge because they think they're the best person to be in charge, you know, yeah. ultimately. And I think... I think there's a possibility it could get there, but I think the problem we have now is, especially when you look at, especially in the YouTube space, a lot of the big channels that people would look to, your play-ons, mini war gaming, tabletop titans, tabletop tactics, you know, in terms of, in terms of my uh, industry, like battle reports, et cetera. If I went to any of those and said, hey, let's all work together under my name, they're all going to go, no, yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. And I don't blame them because I do the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a potential there, but I think it would need to be led by... I think it would need to be led by Games Workshop themselves to make it actually a thing. Yep. And I think, because if they went to uh, uh, people like us and said, hey, we want to bring you on board uh, in this new Netflix model, but then the compensation is going to have to be substantial enough for us to go, I'm prepared to give up my control and my autonomy yeah. um, to come under that umbrella because I see it would be... Like, it's very difficult. There's a, lot more, there's a lot more complication to that, I think, than actually yeah. a lot of people take into consideration. Because I think as con content creators... We are all open to, uh, you know, improving our channels in whatever way, shape, or form. If I said to you, oh, there's this really cool gadget that you can get that basically makes multicam setups really easy, and I've just bought one, and you, you might go, oh, yeah, that is really cool. I'll buy it. Thanks for the heads up. There's that collaboration feature. And then there's things like of, I might send you a video, or you might send me a video and say, what do you think of this? And if I said I'd maybe tone down the graphics or move this there and this, that, and the other, that's the kind of feedback you can you can you can deal with. But if you then if I then said, make me a video, mm. and this is how I want you to make it, yeah. you might you might go, yeah, that all that sounds great. But it might also be, I don't want Joe reading the outro because he can't read. <laughs> But, but like, uh, if the spec sheet says, uh, Joe does this bit, you do that bit, you don't, and you might be like, I don't agree with how that's lined up. And yeah. then I said, yeah, but I'm telling you what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's, you know, that's why we all do YouTube. We all do content ourselves is because we want it to be our masters of our own destiny. Creative freedom. Creative freedom. And also ego. That's 100% ego. The problem is ego. It always will be. Is I'll always think that... What opinion does Liam possibly have on painting videos he doesn't make any? And you will say, what opinion does Josh have on streaming, uh, uh, streaming battle reports? Because he doesn't do any until 
maybe if I was to then start and then even then you would still have you'd have criticism and I'd be like yeah but I've been doing it for six months now why are you coming to me with this yeah and it's been working this way yeah, yeah. and it's 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 how do you deal it's how do you deal with ego as well is a big question mark so whilst I think that kind of model 100% it would be incredible for all of us I think because you know when the tides rise all ships rise this kind of thing you know it's really tough. It's a really tough thing. And like, it's not really, because people I think, not you and me, people who are bigger content creators than us, they would be the ones who are at the director level. We would be the ones contributing. And then there would be people underneath us as well who are smaller channels than us where the real benefit is for them. Yeah. Uh, so basically what we're saying is more members. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we then become the financial giants. We then control it all. Yeah. I mean, look, if, if, <laughs> if, if Games Workshop was to do something like start a funding or a creative fund, you know, like some places do, yeah. like where they went, yeah, we're actually setting aside £1.2 million or whatever, and now creators can submit a brief to us of something they would like to make, and we will fund it. That would be incredible. If that would then be part of Warhammer Plus as well, that would be incredible. But the problem with something like that is um, everybody has an opinion on what's actually worthy. Yeah, also, you know, the problem with that is GW. Yeah. Like the risk of putting their name to, let alone their funding, to something that they then don't have full control over mm. um, is, is something I don't think they'll ever be really comfortable doing. Uh, I mean, I'm under no illusion with the Amazon TV deal that they will probably have strict final say on everything still because it's Games Workshop. They're very protective over their IP. Oh, and rightly so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if we've answered your question, Dean, but we tried. Uh, Carl, thank you. Who says, weird this place you've had sex? I'm not really that adventurous. Probably, <laughs> probably Reading Festival. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know Joe went to Reading Festival. Chris, thank you. He says... Joe's <laughs> Conservatory. <laughs> <laughs> How do you reach awkward places on models easily? Uh, so, uh, I, can, I can demonstrate this for you, right? A lot of people forget that when you're holding the model like this, the worst, the harder thing to do is to move your brush to get to the awkward place. Don't do that. Move the model. Like yeah. that. If you're trying to get... So, say this is a model. Uh, you say I'm holding my painting hand on. There's my model there's the cloak here and you want to get under the cloak. Your normal position for painting like this might be like that. You might use your brush like that. You might use your brush like this. But you've got a more comfortable way that you supply your brush stroke like this type of thing. The easiest thing to do, move the model and keep your brush stroke in a comfortable way that you do it. Nine times out of ten, you'll be able to get to those places. And sometimes it's so awkward to reach that no one's ever going to see it, so it doesn't matter if you just, if you just ram it in there and just shake it about. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you just ram it in there and shake it about. There's another episode title for yeah. you. <laughs> it's, it's Kev. Of those you play COD with from Liam's channel, who is the best and who is the most average player? Uh, Joe's the best. Is he, though? No, no, he genuinely is. Because <laughs> it's weird, because he says every single game he just gets killed by hackers. Yeah, but we all get killed by hackers. <laughs> Now, who's the most average? Oh, I don't know. It's all right. You're allowed to say Brom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like... J j That's unfair to average players, actually. You shouldn't say Brom. Yeah, because I'm a fairly average player. I'm a very average player. We're very average gamers. Mm. Hashtag plug. <laughs> <laughs> Paul says, does Mr. The War Hipster use the term bombardment in his own games? Because uh, of you and Joe, yeah. Good, I'm glad. Thanks, Jill. If you were a limited edition Primaris Lieutenant, what would be your war gear and what is your box art? What would be my war gear? Um, I would 100% have a round storm shield and a power axe. That's what I'd have. That's a good one. I really like... Um, I really like models with massive glaives. <laughs> Sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> like spears and things. Uh, stuff like that. So like, you know, like, I don't know if you know them, the prosecute, uh, the protectors from the Stormcast Eternals. They're the paladin dudes with the enormous um, 
glaives, yeah. and they, they what they do is they wing them around, and it, that deflects them, deflects missiles. That's the whole point. Of I really like like kind of like Elden Ring style, enormous, outsized weapons, but I also really like models at rest. So I don't like I I love models that are kind of leaping into combat or fighting or pointing. But I like ones that are just like, you know, remember that Sergeant Joven model? Yes. Just leaning forward like that after a hard day's work. Or you had Amulius, the lieutenant, who was holding his helmet like that and his sword was Yeah, like I love that. those sculpts. And like, I love it when there's like a sword in a scabbard and they're resting their hand on it or whatever. Just so you want a giant oversized weapon, but your box art is that you're at rest. Yeah, yeah. So love basically it. just like, kind of just like, sort of maybe one leg up on like a tactical rock, obviously. Resting this large kind of weapon across your shoulder, just kind of and maybe like smoking a smoking a cigar or something like that. Love it. I'm a fan. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Matt Kent says, "Thanks, Jill. You're legend." Matt says, "What do you do for beard maintenance?" Uh, I comb it sort of every so often, and I use Kalamazoo from Lush. And that's it. I don't know what that, I don't know what that is. It's just a face and beard. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's all it is. Cool. So you don't go to the beard struggle and use code LT Dems twenty for twenty percent off. No. You can. I mean, I can. Uh, James. You should. <laughs> James, like the favourite races in 40k AOS, as in one from each, mm -hmm. from a law perspective and from a model perspective. So favourite favourite model 40k, favourite range from 40k from a law perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, from a law perspective for 40k. Um, Blood Angels. AOS? Stormcast Eternals. Model range, 40k. The models in 40k are so average these days. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, I don't entirely disagree, but wow. Uh, it's just our uh, favourite model range from, from 40k. Uh, I think of recent times, the, 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 uh, the kind of upgunning of the guard has been, in, it was, I think it was just very, very, very intelligently done. Um, yeah. The guard for model range for you. Yeah, I think I just think yeah, because I think there's something there's something quite compelling about just little men in flak jackets, you know. And then AOS, this one's significantly harder. Yeah, that's impossible. Uh, model range from AOS. I mean, where do you start? What's your favourite one? That's where you start. I mean, Stormcast Eternals, Cities of Sigma, Stormcast Eternals, Sylvaneth, all my favourites. The Flesh Eater Courts. I'm really into them at the minute. Um, I don't think he's doing a good job of answering for a single faction. James no, I, but he did mention Stormcast, and he also mentioned them as his favourite law. So that's your best overall, which is what I, the thing. Yeah, I think if you just had to boil it down to two, probably Stormcast Eternals and Blood Angels, because I mean, even the Space Marines are still cool, aren't they? They are cool, yeah. So yeah, let's just answer we, we from might both. Be, we might be bored of them, but Timmy comes in at twelve years old and sees Space Marines for the first time ever. He probably thinks they're cool. I've only fallen out of love with Space Marines in tenth. Because I thought the releases were crap. But also, so the rules. Every squad needs to have a captain. That's not Space Marines. Well, and sergeants are meaningless. Yeah. But, like, no, just like, if you think of the like 8th and 9th, think of the stuff that came out in addition to the boxes. We still haven't had, we didn't, we didn't get a multi part Inferno squad with different weapon options. No, and yeah. you've had that consistently, everything was done. The only thing that is new, the only thing that has been new, is like the Apothecary Biologist. Everything else has been like kind of, and the Inferno squad technically as well. But like, the rest of it's all been kind of redesigns of old stuff. And it's mm. like, okay, cool. cool. Dave says, which model that, that he has done, that he, which model that he has done that he is most proud of? And are there pictures before, during, and after? So you've said the model is Archaon, mm. you're most proud of. Have you got before, after, and in between images on Instagram or anything? Or is it just follow the video? Yeah, youtube.com forward slash warhipster. You can see it before, during, and after. Um, yeah. 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 Then he says, which miniature is he painted that he's most proud of? Same fucking question, Dave. Same answer. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Ross, what is your favourite flavour of paint and why is it null oil? <laughs> Actually, the, you know what does weirdly taste? It smells like it tastes a lot nicer than it actually does. Um, I, the, I actually shouldn't answer that. Carry on. The army paint, the speed paints. And the Vallejo Express colours, they weirdly smell and they sort of taste like, oh, they could be quite nice. And then they're immediately horrible because it's oh. paint and you should never drink it. Yeah, never drink it, yeah. Uh, do, you lick, do you lick brushes? Yeah. I lick brushes. Yeah, yeah. I'm terrible for it. Uh, what rules from AOS would you like to see 40k adapt? 
and vice versa. Oh, to bring into 40k? Yeah, what rule would you bring into 40k? <laughs> so uh, we'll make, to make this simple, because of time, we're yeah. fucking Jesus Christ. A rule for Major Sigma you'd like to see in 40k? Uh, that um, characters basically issue commands. And then a rule from Age of Sigma that you'd like to see in 40k. No, we just, we just did that one. 40K. Other way around, 40k to Age of Sigma. None of it. Never corrupt my favourite game. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Nick. Uh, Kev says, favourite KFC side in the correct order of preference, beans, corn, gravy, coleslaw. Gravy is at the top. Number one, your correct choice, yeah. Beans is second. Good, yeah, okay. Coleslaw's probably third. Cobb four. Cobb four. There's a reason why we're together. I mean, coleslaw and cob, I think, would be interchangeable depending on my mood, but that's probably generally, it, it, instinctively, that's how I'm answering that. I think we just became best friends. <laughs> uh, Jill says, who has the best bum in Warhammer? Who has the best bum in Warhammer? Yeah. Obviously me. <laughs> I you sit do, on my fact, bum. Look like a bum, yeah. I, I sit on my <laughs> bum all day, every day, and it treats me very well. Uh, thank you, Joe. You're a legend. Jill, John McArdle says, how do you keep yourself motivated and not burning out? What are the things you do to keep learning, and how do you challenge yourself? I avoid burnout because I do so many different things. I'm always painting different models. Okay. Every week. So variety. It's, yeah, variety is the spice of life, as they say. I, I, I think I would get burnt out if I painted as much as I do, but I was only painting, like, for the next six months, I'll be painting 8,000 points of Blood Angels. Mm -hmm. You know, I love my Blood Angels. I really love it, but I will do five of them, and then I will move on, and then I'll do some Night Haunt, and then I'll do some Cities of Sigmar, and then I'll do some Whammer Underworlds, because, yeah. you know, that's what the content schedule dictates. But... Uh, I avoid burnout by just doing a ton of different stuff. Uh, and because I love mechanics of painting, I've always got something different that I can be painting. So I avoid it that way. Um, what was the second? What, was the uh, how do you, what are the things you do to keep learning and how do you challenge yourself? Uh, well, again, so it, within that variation, it's when I see something that's there, you can choose not to do it. So like, um, what was it I did OSL on? Belial, I think, got that flamey thing on the on the ground, and the, oh yeah, the 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 statue that's holding a sword in the ground, the burnt skeleton with the flame. Um, I looked at that, and there's I could have easily have not done any uh, object source lighting on that. I didn't do loads, but to me, I learned a lot more in that in that just tiny little corner doing that. And so it's just for me, it's like being unafraid to try new stuff. Because as I said earlier, I back myself. So you so you literally learn by experimenting. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I like <clears throat> obviously, you know, you look for inspiration from other places and stuff. And occasionally, I'll see like another painter will be like, um, great a great example. Actually, I didn't mention her earlier, Darcy Bono. She does really great like mixes of contrast and stuff. And I go, you know, I never, I never, I never conceived of that one. I'll mm. give that a go. Or I might tweak it slightly, this, that, and the other, and um, to do slightly different things. The whole, the whole thing, I think, is the hardest part of always pushing yourself to learn is always being open to the possibility that you will learn something. Yeah. Uh, and I think I always try to maintain an open attitude towards the possibility that I might learn. That's cool. I like it. Thanks, John. You're a legend. Joseph says, what was your biggest aha moment during painting for techniques or colour usage? So a moment where you did something, ah, there you go. Yeah, I, th I think I think it was in the early days of contrast when I tried blending with it. Yeah, like power weapons and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, I, was, I wonder if this will work because it's really wet paint. <laughs> Wash my brush. Oh my god, a whole new world. <laughs> I got Did you sing my, the song? Yeah, yeah, I got on the magic carpet. <laughs> <laughs> I dressed up my cat with uh, in Jasmine's outfit, yeah, obviously, of course, because I didn't fit the door set. Yeah. Um, anymore. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Jake. COVID, COVID ruined that. And then finally, yeah. Jake, you legend, says with the giant horned rat becoming a fully fledged chaos god in Age of Sigma, do you think they should replicate that in Warma 40k as they have stated before that the chaos gods are the same in 40k, the old world, and AOS? Oh, so should the great horned rat come into 40k? Should it become the fifth chaos god in 40k and arguably then bring in some sort of space gaven type scenario? I'm not opposed to it. No, neither am I. I think them well. I think I think Skaven are. I think of three things when I think of Warhammer. I think of Lizardmen. I think of Skaven. 
I think of Space Marines. Those are iconic. They are about as Warhammer as it's possible to be. Agree. Obviously, two of them sit in fantasy battles and one of them sits in 40k. Because I think, when I think of Warhammer, I think of Warhammer fantasy battles and I think of Skaven. They are so unironically and so unashamedly Warhammer. That mm. is right there. They are the most Warhammer of Warhammery things that can possibly Warhammer. Same for like uh, Lizardmen. I think they've always been. I think the way that Games Workshop does both Gaven and Lizardmen, Lizardmen or Seraphon as I now usually call them, the way they do them is so them yeah. that they are. They kind of take over how I picture it should be in other things. There's not an original concept of Rat Man or a Lizard Man, but when I see Rat Men or Lizard Men appear in the other thing, I think these are a imitation of yes. of that. So I, that, that and that's what I mean. I know that they're not for everybody who's out there. It's just like they didn't come up with it. I was like, yes, I know that they're not. But the way they do, I think they're so iconically Warhammer. Um, should Skaven appear in 40k? I'm not opposed to it. But at the same time, do you really want Demon Skaven? I, I kind of, I'm like really tall. On, on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, definitely, because it yeah. sounds cool. But on the other hand, I'm like, but it's also okay to keep something that's for fantasy or, or uh, Sigma and not bring it into, and not port it across necessarily. Yeah. Um, I, I, the way I, I know that the Chaos Gods, narratively speaking, are prevalent in all three galaxies and that kind of exist in all the same things. Like Joe spoke about the Liam and Joe show last week. About how they're all in all the in all the realms at once and time stands still. Blah, blah. I, I actually weirdly have always thought of uh, Sigma and 40k as completely different narrative arcs and universes. Yeah. Same. Now I know that the way that they kind of they've built it specifically is that actually in Sigma times it's possible to see Grey Knights because of the way that time warp works and the warp etc. But I have always seen them as very very separate um, universes, and I don't necessarily think I want. Space Skaven as chaos in 40k. Mm. I'm happy to just keep it. Like I'm, I'm very, very hopeful we'll see a whole brand new model range for them in Age yeah. Sigma with the new edition. And I'm like, just keep it there. Yeah, I think there's like recurrent themes, but then I think in 40k they picture chaos as like a dark mirror to humanity's emotions. In Age of Sigma, they're not. They're kind of these insidious beings that seduce you with, yeah, with powers beyond what your mortal. Because if you think of how powerful a space marine is, why would you go, I can give you a tentacle? <laughs> yeah, I can give you a wiggly appendage. Yeah, you'll be able to hold three guns at once. <laughs> I don't need to. I only need one. Um, so, like, because you, you see the world of 40K through the eyes of the space marine, you don't really see it through the eyes of the average citizenry. Whereas in fantasy battles, you... Everybody was the average citizenry because you didn't have superhuman soldiers. So I think there was still that kind of, there is a bit of a dark reflection of a hum, humans' emotions. But they, didn't, they don't really sit in the warp, which is alongside everything. Because yeah. in Age of Sigmar in particular, you have the realm of chaos. That is just where all chaos is. It, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't sit as a dark mirror to all the other yeah, yeah. Uh, mortal realms. It is its own mortal realm. So I think, yeah, it's, it's conceivably stuff could come across. I would prefer that it didn't. Okay. Because, you know, I think Age of Sigmar has just got this really good thing going on. What I would actually prefer 40k to do is to just kind of take the shackles off a little bit. Mm, agree. I think if Chaos Demons were to get a, a, a whole redo, um, I want them to look at Vashtor and go, right, how do we put that into... How do we put elements of that and go crazy with it and go into, like, 15 new model kits for the yeah. Chaos Demons? Same thing with Chaos Space Marines. A lot of people have asked for a long time, when are we going to get spiky intercessors? Why do you want spiky intercessors? Why do you not want more? Remember well, I, I, this is, I've said this before. I don't want spiky intercessors. One of the things I hate the most about Chaos Space Marines is if you buy a Land Raider or a Predator, you literally get the exact same kit that you'll always get yep. and a sprue with some spikes on it. Yeah. And so that's what's so really nice about the, about the, 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 uh, the Death Guard is you didn't get that. Exactly. You can have Death Guard Predators, but what you got was the Plague Burst Crawler, which was a thousand times better. You think of like the Shadow Spear stuff. Remember the Greater Possessed? I know he's just a normal Possessed now, but I was like, more of that. Yeah, 100%. More I agree. of that, please. I agree. You are amazing, sir. So are you. Well, you're all right. Uh, <laughs> if you've made it to this part of the video, give yourselves a pat on the back. It was amazing. That's a slug. We have been going for like three hours nearly. 
We got a lot to say. Oh, James and I was an hour and nine, an hour and fifty nine minutes. I was like, that's a long one. Well, it was a very long one. We're just close to friends then, clearly. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> I hope you guys have enjoyed having Mr. the Hipster here in the studio. Uh, please, 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 please check out those links in the description below if you haven't already. Hit that subscribe button to his channel. Like I said, I'll link other things. I'll link um, Instagram down there, etc. as well. Um, two videos a week, is it? Is the standard? Two videos and two streams. And at two the streams. So he streams on Mondays and Wednesdays as well. Check out the channel. If, you th if you're feeling really generous, become a member of the channel as well because it supports him and the work that he's doing. And I think, honestly speaking, in terms of general accessibility for the average like wargamer, they're the best out there. So Thank you. You're incredible for coming down. If you were around on the channel when he did come down and you're not new here, you probably would have seen the two streams already. But if you are new or you've just seen this for the first time, we've done two streams as well where we're learning current version of AOS with Josh. They are live streams, but they are obviously watchable again on demand. So you can check those out as well. Uh, obviously, if you've got anything that you're thinking about painting uh, that currently exists out there, there's a chance there's probably a video on Josh's channel that shows you how to do it. 800 videos, you said? There's over right? 800 videos. Over there, 800 yeah. tutorials. They're all incredible. They're all amazing. Um, so go find a video, watch it, absorb it, try and copy it, leave a comment, say that you came from us because I like spreading the love around. You're amazing for coming down. Thank you for having me. We did put him up in the bedroom. We did allow him to have a duvet. Yeah. yeah. You did threaten me with outside. No, no, chat threatened you with outside. Oh, did they? Yeah, it was oh, yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Chad. Thanks for coming and answering those questions. Uh, I think we talked about some really interesting issues there. Uh, again, like I said to you last time, I hope you guys are enjoying this new series. I'm thinking and hoping, what are we, we're in March now? Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping next month we're getting peachy in. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Now Don't you worry. see some subscribers. It won't be as long as this video because we're not as good friends. Well, you might become even better friends with him. If I see that that interview is like four hours long, <laughs> I'm going to remove you from my Christmas card list. Oh, yeah, you. Okay. No, You're of course amazing. I won't. <laughs> please, please, please make sure you go subscribe to Mr. The War Hipster. He's an incredible person, and I think he deserves, I think you deserve all the support you get. Oh, thank Genuinely. you. Genuinely. I think the same for you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, you amazing people, for watching. If you haven't already, smashed that like button, and we'll see you in the next one.